the mayor's uh, traveling today. He's at the Conference of Mayors, yeah, the U.S. Conference of Mayors. And I'm Commissioner Dan Ryan. I'll pre be presiding this morning. Keelan, can you please call the roll? Good morning. Rubio. Here. Ryan. Here. Gonzalez. Here. Naps. Here. Wheeler. Okay, we will now hear from legal counsel on the rules of order and decorum. We have Anne in the box today. Welcome. Thank you, Commissioner Ryan. Welcome to the Portland City Council. City Council is holding hybrid public meetings with in-person attendance in addition to electronic attendance. If you wish to testify before council in person or virtually, you must sign up in advance by visiting the council agenda on the council clerk's webpage at portland.gov slash council slash agenda. You may sign up for communications to briefly speak about any subject. You may also sign up for public testimony on resolutions, reports, or the first readings of ordinances. Written testimony may be submitted to cctestimony at portlandoregon.gov. Your testimony should address the matter being considered at the time. When testifying, please state your name for the record. Your address is not necessary. Please disclose if you are a lobbyist. If you are representing an organization, please identify it. For testifiers joining virtually, please unmute yourself once the council clerk calls your name. The presiding officer preserves order and decorum during city council meetings so that everyone can feel welcome, comfortable, respected, and safe. The presiding officer determines the length of testimony. Individuals generally have three minutes to testify unless otherwise stated. A timer will indicate when your time is done. Disruptive conduct such as shouting, refusing to conclude your testimony when your time is up, or interrupting others' testimony or council deliberations will not be allowed. If there are disruptions, a warning will be given that further disruption may result in the person being ejected for the remainder of the meeting. After being ejected, a person who fails to leave the meeting is subject to arrest for trespass. Additionally, council may take a short recess and reconvene virtually. Thank you, Anne. And now, uh, first up is communications. Keelan, can you please call the first item, item 34? Request of Hazel R. Dennis to address council regarding fraud concerns and homelessness. Welcome, Hazel. It's good to see you here. Thank you. Yeah. Um, this yeah. is my first time, so you guys all forgive me. I'm coming here humbly. That's good to see you, Hazel. The green light's on, so just uh, go ahead and Okay. Take your time, speak into the mic. You have three minutes. Okay. Thank and at you. the end of three minutes, uh, we'll kindly have you wrap up. Okay. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. I'm easy. My name is Hazel R. Dennis, and I'm concerned about the homelessness and the way they became homeless. And so I speak for myself. Um, I'm very concerned about it. And I want to know what I can do to help. Give me some guidance. Because me, myself, became homeless due this, during this crisis. People are homeless because of mental illness. They're homeless by scams. They're homeless by fraud. I so happen to be homeless by fraud. And the avenues that I went to get homeless, we have to create a justice system for the homeless to help me tackle that, that um, thing. And that's all I want to say, because this is new to me. And I'm just trying to figure it out. How did I become homeless? And that's what I want to say, because I'm a person that had two homes pay bills ahead of time, on time, and I still ended up being homeless. And I want to know how this is possible. <clears throat> okay? Anybody want to ask me something? I'm finished. I just want you to know I'm coming. I'm learning, and I want help for people like me that do everything right, but still become homeless. 
Hazel, thank you so much for being here. It's so thank important you. to hear voices of people with the lived experience. Thanks. Appreciate it. Thanks. Okay. Okay, next item. Item 34. Request of Eli Spivak to address council regarding Electrify PDX home certification and yard sign program. Uh, shall I read all of the uh, Yeah, it sounds like, Eli, so you want to have all three of you that are bunched together here? Is, is that you, Leonard? Okay. And that's you, Jane? Okay, I'm okay. going to go ahead and read the other two. Got it. Uh, item 36, request of Leonard Barrett to address council regarding Electrify PDX home certification and yard sign program. And item 37, request of Jane Stackhouse to address council regarding the need to electrify buildings and homes. Welcome, Eli. Go ahead and start. Leonard, start. Or Leonard, Thank whatever. You. Thank you. Thank you. Here. I'll, I'll you get nine minutes total. <laughs> Great. How's that? Okay. Uh, good morning, uh, Commission President Ryan. Uh, Commissioners Maps, Rubio, and Gonzalez. Uh, my name is Leonard Barrett. Uh, here in my capacity as board president of Families for Climate, we're a nonprofit supporting parents and families to take action to ensure a livable planet for today's youth and all future generations. Along with Eli and Jane, I'm here to talk about a new project Families for Climate has sponsored called Electrify PDX. Eli will provide an overview of the project itself, but I wanted to provide some context by way of my own experience. My family's in the process of going fully electric in our home, having now transitioned off of fossil fuels for our HVAC and hot water, with only our gas stove yet to swap out. Which is ironic, uh, because as a parent, it's the stove that I've become most concerned about, and I'll explain why. Um, as you may know, methane gas is a potent climate pollutant with 80 times the climate warming effect of carbon dioxide, but many in our community have only recently learned about its impact on indoor air quality. Of greatest concern for me personally is the finding that children living in households with gas stoves are 42% more likely to develop asthma symptoms. If you have not already seen it, I would encourage you to check out Multnomah County Health Department's recently released report about the public health impact of gas stoves. Because of the benefits for pediatric health and public health generally, the cost savings to utility customers, and of course the benefits to, uh, for community resilience and the planet, Families for Climate is excited to support the great work Electrify PDX is doing to ensure that our community understands the benefits of a fully electrified home, as well as the programs and resources available to make home electrification accessible to all Portlanders. Electrify PDX complements many recent programs and policies to make this happen. The Portland Clean Energy Fund is helping to ensure that lower income Portlanders can transition onto electric heat pump technology. The Inflation Reduction Act is helping to broaden access to home electrification through various tax credits and rebates. And Oregon's Community Solar Program makes it possible for any utility customer to ensure that their electrified home is powered by clean, renewable electricity. Additionally, under the program, income qualifying households can reduce their bill by, bills by 30%. With these and other programs in place, Portland is poised to be a natural, excuse me, national leader in the equitable and just transition to fully electric buildings. We hope that the city, across its various functions, but especially through BDS, BPS, Housing, and Prosper, will support and promote community programs such as Electrify PDX that will accelerate building electrification and make it available to all. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to share, and I'll turn it over to Eli to tell you more about the specifics of the program. Good morning, um, city councilors. My name is Eli Spivak, and I'm a co-founder of Electrify PDX, among other hats. As Leonard shared, Portland is primed to, for a leap toward 100% clean energy homes for residents across the income spectrum. We're excited to be part of this and to partner with Electrify Now Coalition, Community Energy Project, and Rewiring America to make the renewable energy transition easier, faster, and more equitable. But why are people electrifying their homes? I got a couple slides here. I'll be really quick. Um, if we go to Share screen. Look at that. So a typical home uses electricity from plugs and lights. A car uses gas, a gas furnace, and a gas water heater. If you do all the great efficient things your grandparents taught you about using a sweater and taking not as many showers or cold ones sometimes, you might decrease your greenhouse gases by 20%. If you go to electric, you can source your electricity renewably today through community solar or a 
a utility program or solar panels if you happen to have a roof. Use that electricity to power your car or your bike. Use the same electricity for your heat pump and for heat pump water heater, and you've dropped your carbon emissions for your house down to zero. And people are doing that today. They have been for a couple of years now, but it's invisible from the street. That's why we started this new program, Electrify PDX, to bring visibility and to provide education so more people can do it. So a typical house goes from 20 tons of CO2 and 4,000 bucks a year in utilities down to zero tons of CO2 and less money for utilities because gas prices are going up for car and for methane gas. So here's the program. We have show and tell that we're going electric for a healthy home and planet in English and Spanish. It's modeled after backyard habitats program that Audubon runs where you get, may help you get a plan for a home update. We help you find contractors and incentives celebrate success, and inspire others to do the same. Here's how it works. You get a, I'm gonna stop sharing here. Well, maybe, can you figure out how to stop sharing? Thanks. Um, anyone who wants can get one of these signs. Then we've got these sticker badges. So as you complete each stage of the process, you apply the sticker for heating system, appliances, water heater, and sourcing your electricity renewably. It might take six months or six years, but when you're done, you get a certification sign, like this. And we also have ones for businesses, they're English and Spanish. Um, move my notes here. Um, we've also applied for a PSEF mini grant to translate more of our materials into Spanish and make these signs free for participants in City of Portland programs. So we just started a few months ago. We've got over 60 households enrolled, including homeowners, renters, and mobile homeowner. Um, we do educational presentations to all sorts of groups with Electrify Now, Adidas employees, First Unitarian Church, Cooley Association of Neighbors, real estate continuing education classes. Um, they keep, requests keep coming in. We've connected with the Community Energy Project and affordable housing nonprofits to make sure that their tenants sign up for community solar. They're eligible for it, but they're not necessarily signing up. We certify businesses. Coley Builds is the first business certification. Mamuk Tukati is an affordable housing project by NEA, both fully certified. We share contractor referrals to people who actually know how to electrify. There's still contractors out there who don't, and they'll try and talk you out of it. And we set up an Electrify PDX Facebook group, over 130 members right now, um, where people are sharing tips and getting answers to their questions. It's a no-guilt program. We work with people wherever they're at, recognizing the gas is probably more efficient than the thing came before it. And things you can do as city council, you can sign up today. You can share information about Electrify PDX through like BPS's brochures, I know about those, and other communications. And if you build a building or, build or convert a building to all electric, let us know, we'll get you a plaque. And with that, I'll hand the baton over to Jane. All right, thank you, Eli. Um, Commissioner Ma Maps, uh, Gonzalez Rubio, and uh, Ryan, it's nice to be here. I'm Jane Stackhouse, I live in Northeast Portland, and I have uh, an, in an owner-occupied duplex It was built in 1925. I got duplex, because I'm a duplex, um, and of course got one in Spanish, so we can really share that. Uh, <clears throat> My electrification history goes back to the 1960s when my father was an advertising executive for a big gas company in Seattle. And he explained to me that it was called natural gas because that sounded safer and cleaner than methane. 60 years later, as you heard from Leonard and Eli, we really know it's a problem. It's a problem for indoor air quality. It's also a huge problem for global warming. Uh, when I retired, I became a climate reality project leader, and I'm also on the steering committee for the Metro Climate Action Team. We work to reduce greenhouse gas emissions in Oregon. So the combination of all of those um, and the concern that the IPCC voiced that we need to get off of methane use as soon as possible in order to stay within our targets for um, uh, keeping global warming down um, I decided I needed to take some action. I don't have any control, none of us have control over the methane that is leaking up through the ever-warming Arctic, but I do have control of that duplex. So in 2020, I refinanced it and decided I would go all electric. I found a good contractor, um, sat down with the tenant in the other side who was like, what is this heat pump? Sounds like crazy magic to me, and had the contractor explain to her about how heat pumps remove warm air from the air, concentrate that, and then can heat our homes, even if our home is warmer inside than the air is outside. Um, I replaced two high-efficiency gas furnaces, one in each unit, and we have been staying warm and cozy since then. Um,
there are also in-ground heat pump situations and uh, where we can dig into the ground, put pipes and cooling in there, um, and be able to run our heat pumps off of the 55 degrees that the ground stays. I keep hoping that uh, the gas company will pick up on that one. So I ask you, please, to promote this program. We need to electrify. Um, it's hard for me to tell my neighbors I'm doing this without a sign, and I hope the city of Portland will support that because it really is an excellent opportunity for good heating uh, and cooling for everyone. Thank you very much for the time. Thank you, Leonard, Eli, and Kate. I see that my colleagues have their hands up. Commissioner Maps. Sure, I just wanted to take a moment to thank our panelists for that compelling uh, presentation and to thank you for your important, important work. Um, this very much complements some um, initiatives that I see in the city right now. For example, in coming weeks, you'll see PBOT come forward with a plan to add more um, charge EV uh, um, charging stations in public mm -hmm. spaces. And I know Commissioner Rubio, uh, uh, um, through planning and sustainability and PCEF um, also has some important uh, climate action plans uh, in the works too. Uh, so I'm excited to work with you and the public to make a, a greener Portland and um, I thank you for being here today. Right. Thank you. Commissioner Rubio. Thank you, um, uh, Council President. Um, I just wanted to chime in here. Um, uh, I first heard about this uh, program from Eli, and I am a huge fan of this. I think it's very needed, and I'm very eager to see how the city can partner with you to raise the, the visibility of this. Um, and uh, please keep us updated on your progress um, uh, with PSAF and with all the other projects and partners you have going on. And um, yeah, we'll be in touch to see how we can um, help lift this up more. And my chief of staff is in, in council chambers, uh, too. So if on your way out, uh, if you have a minute to connect with her, um, we can get some information exchanged. So thanks so much for coming today. This is really, really a, a great thing for the community. Thank you, Commissioner Rubio. I just have one question. And I maybe you said it in your <laughs> comments, Eli, could sure, tell. Fast. But what's the typical, really important question? Typical is a wide range, I know a cost for a household to convert? There's not a typical, unfortunately. If people right. already have resistance electric, then they're going to um, heat pump electric. Um, so they don't have to do any electrical work. In fact, using less electricity than they did before. If they have gas appliances, then um, it can, the heating system um, itself could be 12,000 or so. Um, the tankless ga ga gas water heater, not a tankless, a heat pump water heater, um, the heater itself is, boy, some 500 to 1,000 bucks because there's a great rebate for that, and then there's an installation charge. Um, ranges are about 1,000 um, bucks. And um, the reason people are getting a lot of interest now is because the IRA program went into effect January 1st with huge um, tax credits, and later in the year, there'll be customer decrease of your price, just drop down your price. So there's significant incentives so that going electric now is less expensive or at least no more expensive than replacing with the same old gas furnace. And you mentioned programs, I recall. So that's on your website, all this information. It's more it detailed. Is, yeah. And then and just try one. And it's changing all the time, so we provide updates. The Thanks. stickers, so the stickers, do they like go on the original one? And then when you get all of them, then you get the new sign? It's like collecting badges, if you know. You just literally take it off. Slap it on the sign. Slap it on the sign. Yeah. And then work your way up to Then you a graduate set. to that sign. OK, got that's it. it. <laughs> Thanks so much for being here. Yeah. appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah. Keelan, please call the next item. Item 38, request of Jay Friedman to address council regarding homelessness and solutions. Jay's in the chambers? Yeah, Jay was gonna join in person. Doesn't look like they've arrived. Oh, okay. wait a minute. Oh, he's second. online? Yeah. Okay. Let me in. Welcome, Jay. On mute, okay, join family. We, we can hear you. Three minutes, Jay. Go ahead. Okay. Looks like they're um, moving. They should come back up here in just a moment. There we go. Jay, can you hear us? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Great. Yep. Yes. Loud and clear, right. Jay. All right. I would like to say thank you for letting me attend your meeting. That being said, let's get to the issue at hand. Um, as you guys know, you guys have a huge homelessness in Portland, the homeless problem in Portland, not as bad as California. Um, 
you can never eliminate homelessness, but you can limit how many people are out here. You guys have how many of a thousand, like thousands of abandoned buildings and houses that, in my opinion, could be renovated, leased out, um, and turned it into housing programs. People like me, I don't smoke, I don't drink, I'm sober. Um, as you can tell, I street perform to make money, and because my income is not taxed, I can't afford a place to stay. And I think you guys as city council are in a position that you guys could work programs. I can only offer so certain solutions. And um, yeah, I have a buddy, for example, he lives out of his RV, but because his RV is older, certain RV parks do not allow him to be on property. If we were to amend rules like that, I think that you can lessen how many people would be out here on the street. Any thoughts or questions? We really appreciate your testimony, Jay. Uh, thank you so much for showing up today. Thank you, sir. All right. Have a good one. Have a good one. Bye-bye. Get me out of this. Move, yes. Time certain. Item 39, accept the Police Accountability Commission quarterly report for July through September 2022. Thank you, Council President Ryan. Um, good to see you, good to see Commissioners Maps and Rubio, and nice to meet you, Commissioner Gonzalez. Um, I'm joined by the co-chairs of the Police Accountability Commission for the period covered in this quarterly report, which covers July through September 2022. Um, on Zoom, we have co-chair uh, Lavisa Lloyd, and here in Chambers, we have co-chairs Faith Aiken and Simab Husseini. I will pass it over to them at this time. Uh, greetings, uh, Commissioners, Maps, uh, Ryan, and welcome, uh, Commissioner Gonzalez. Um, my name is Simab Husseini. Uh, I was the co-chair of this uh, phase. Um, and uh, yeah, we'd like to thank you, uh, uh, thank the City Council for allowing us the opportunity to present the quarterly report um, of the Police Accountability Commission for July through September 2022. 20, uh, um, I'm joined by my two uh, co-chair colleagues, um, Lavisa Lloyd, uh, who's online with us, and uh, Faith Aiken. And we're all members of the Police Accountability Commission appointed by the Portland City Council. And we were the co-chairs of the Police Accountability Commission uh, during the fact-finding phase of the work. Um, everything covered by this quarterly report was part of the fact-finding phase. Today, we'll be providing a brief overview of the quarterly report and the work the commission did from July 1st to September 30th, 2022. Future quarterly reports will, be, will cover more recent activities and members of the commission will return to the present October to December quarterly report in February. Hello, I'm Lavisa Lloyd. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, thank you again for having us. Uh, all right. In November 2020, 82% uh, of Portland voters supported the creation of Charter Section 210, which creates a new board to uh, both replace the current system of administrative investigations, discipline, and accountability and to allow for a greater community voice in changing the policies and directives of Portland Police. The Police Accountability Commission was created by the City Council to develop the parameters and details of the Community Police Oversight Board authorized under this charter section. Next slide, please. Yeah, can we move on to the next, next slide? Thank you. 
uh, from December 2021 through March 2022, the commission was convened and working through its organizational phase, um, which I think you heard about last time. This progress was, um, yeah, this was addressed uh, uh, previously um, by, oh, sorry, by our colleagues who were co-chairs during that period of time. They presented the Q1 quarterly report to city council last summer. Um, from April to June, the commission began its fact-finding phase, focusing primarily on research and hearing from experts and affected parties. We, were, we reported on that during the presentation of the Q2 quarterly report in September. Uh, beginning in July, the commission continued to hear from experts and affected parties, as well as additional parts of the current system. The work continued with developing draft documents, which indicate the commission's assessment of the current system in Portland, practices from other jurisdictions, and proposals from subject matter experts. The commission also continued to plan community engagement events. In all, the commission and its subcommittees met 22 times over this three-month period, which means the PAC remained one of the most active parts of the city government. These meetings also included seven briefings. Slide three. Um, the fact-finding phase resulted in the adoption of three documents, uh, one of which was during this quarter. These documents are not code recommendations, but set shared understandings among members as to what information has been learned and the Commission's viewpoints on it. Uh, they'll each be an important contribution to the Commission's eventual, uh, eventual decisions as recommendations to the City Council. Um, the first document is the areas of agreement on barriers to police accountability and best practices. Um, um, the best practices in Portland. Uh, barriers to police accountability are the problem that the commission seeks to solve in its overall work. And therefore, this document is the problem statement of the commission's work. However, the commission also wants to recognize those practices which are working and should be retained or replicated in the new system. So the document includes best practices as well. The commission approved this document on September 29th. Good morning, I'm Faith Aiken. The second document is the areas of agreement on proposals to consider or to avoid from subject matter experts. The commission is aware that numerous experts from community-based organizations to national organizations to individuals working in other jurisdictions have suggested ideas and this document will give preliminary impressions of the commission's views on these proposals. The document was drafted in the subcommittee on research and referred to the full commission during this quarter, but had not yet been approved by the full commission. The third document is the areas of agreement on best practices and practices to avoid from other jurisdictions. By assessing other jurisdictions' practices, the commission developed ideas, saw how the work together create, could create a new system and evaluated their effectiveness at achieving the goals of the commission's new system. This document was close to done um, by being drafted in the subcommittee on research at the end of September. All three documents uh, will be references for the commission's decision on what to recommend to the city council in Portland's new system. The actual recommendation development began with the next phase of work, which our colleagues will discuss uh, when the Q4 report is presented in February. Please. And yeah, next slide. Um, during this period, the commission heard from the Mental Health Alliance, which is one of the two Amici Friends of the Court, um, to the USDOJ v. the City of Portland Settlement Agreement. We held the attorney-client privilege briefing with the City Attorney's Office, which which was required of us by by Council. We received a briefing from other amicus to the settlement agreement, which is the Albina Ministerial Alliance for Justice and Police Reform. Both commissioners, Ryan and Rubio, were briefed uh, the commission as well. 
the Portland Police Association, which is a larger police collective bargaining unit and is also an intervener in the settlement agreement, briefed the commission. Finally, the US Department of Justice briefed the full commission. On behalf of the commission, we would like to thank all of our briefers for coming, and in particular, those here today, Commissioners Ryan and Rubio um, as well. Um, when, when we did this last time, uh, you weren't yet on the list because the briefings were in July and our quarterly report was only through June, but we're happy to recognize uh, you now and thank you for coming in to speak with us then. Also, as a side note, we haven't yet hosted a briefing from Commissioner Gonzalez, um, and we're looking forward to welcoming you to Police Accountability Commission soon. And slide five. Thank you. There are many highly trained specialized workers, um, both professionals and volunteers, working in the police accountability system in Portland right now. And we do want to recognize the, the efforts, the good faith efforts and the good work of those individuals. Um, there are also many barriers to accountability and both of those things can be true at the same time. Uh, in fact, it, it's often the individuals working within the system who have given us the best information about what kinds of barriers to accountability exist in the system because they're the most familiar with it and uh, where it can improve. So, that said, the Commission identified several barriers to police accountability in the current system. Um, many of these were identified by briefers, including police briefers. Uh, these are just barriers we identified. They're not part of the Commission's official recommendations, which will be presented later this year, but they're one of the many things that will help inform the creation of those recommendations. Um, our full report is 16 pages long, and I encourage you to read it. Um, I can only give a very brief overview of our findings here. So uh, the system lacks transparency, um, in particular for people who file complaints with the system. Uh, I don't think this will come as a, a big surprise to anyone. Uh, the complaint process itself, the investigation into the complaint, and then the reporting um, of the, the outcome of the complaint um, and any updates uh, regarding the investigation process, these are all areas in which uh, transparency was identified as a, a big barrier to, to meaningful accountability and uh, meaningful engagement uh, with the system. Um, the CRC Vice Chair Yumi Delgado described the system as maddeningly opaque, um, which I think gives you a good idea. Um, it's just very difficult to get updates of any kind. Uh, and as City Commissioner Rubio said, no one should have to wait months to receive word from the city about what the progress of their complaint is. Um, next, we identified the complexity of the current system as a barrier to accountability. Again, I'm sure this will not come as a surprise to anyone. Um, we tried to find a really good flowchart and there are multiple conflicting flowcharts showing how a complaint is actually addressed. Um, it's super complex for complainants. It's complex for community members. Um, we also heard from both Deputy Chief Mike Frum and PPA President Aaron Schmautz um, that the system is incredibly complicated for law enforcement as well. Um, accessibility and equity, uh, we identified several barriers regarding equity and accessibility issues. For example, the system is significantly less accessible for people who are houseless, for people with disabilities, for people with mental illness, for people with inflexible work schedules, and for people from other marginalized and historically excluded groups. Um, Casey Lewis from the Mental Health Alliance told us that for people with mental illness, the current police accountability system is, quote, broken from top to bottom. Uh, perception and trust. The public has little faith in the current system and lacks trust in its ability or willingness to admit wrongdoing, to repair community trust, or to change officer behavior. Uh, many members of the public would rather choose not to interact with the accountability process at all. Uh, current laws and policies. Uh, the current system is governed and protected by several intersecting layers of local, state, and federal law and policy, including and especially labor law. This is where complexity really comes back into it. 
as well. Um, the current system is also notably largely the legacy of many years of collective bargaining by the police collective bargaining units or associations with the city and the public has had very little uh, view into that or input into that, uh, that process. Uh, effectiveness, it is frankly impossible to tell whether the current system meaningfully reduces misconduct. Uh, the data simply um, are not there. At the very least, it's quite clear that the system does not meet its own internally mandated deadlines. And um, that's, a, that's a huge issue for complainants. Again, going back to transparency. Uh, conflicts of interest uh, on a fundamental level, the current system still largely relies on the police bureau to investigate itself in most cases. Uh, internal affairs investigators, we have heard, give tremendous deference and wide latitude to officer judgment. Um, and the police review board, which is tasked with reviewing investigations and recommending findings, um, uh, always has more members who are representatives of PPB than members who are representing the community. So it is more heavily weighted towards PPB representation. Mm -hmm. Culture, the current system exists within a culture which is unfortunately characterized by an adversarial relationship between police and the public. Uh, community groups report encountering intimidation, harassment, and retaliation by police when filing reports of misconduct. Inadequate resources for community oversight. Um, volunteers uh, make up an enormous part of this system. Uh, volunteers, in particular, the Citizen Review Committee, give an enormous amount of their time, resources, and emotional labor. Um, they handle very large case loads and massive case files, um, but they receive very little funding, staffing, training, mental health support, um, or other forms of support. Um, volunteers often feel like their work is not valued um, or that their input is not taken um, or that their, their policy recommendations go unheard. Um, another source of community oversight um, is Portland City Council itself, which uh, may hear some cases upon appeal. And we heard directly from Mayor Wheeler that City Council is really not an appropriate venue for uh, most cases of this kind. Uh, I believe he compared it to sending circuit court appeals to the DMV. He said it's just not the right venue. The city council is not the right place to adjudicate these complex cases. Uh, it really is better served through bodies that have the technical knowledge and the time and the energy to focus on these cases um, because they deserve that focus. Um, again, there's so much more behind each of these points and I encourage you to read the entire report. Uh, the City Council required the PAC to look at barriers to police accountability. However, we also wanted to consider and look at a holistic view and recognize that there are components of the system that are working. Uh, they could be maintained and we, recognize, and we want to recognize best practices as we found them. Uh, we categorize these best practices into seven categories. Uh, if something's listed here, it's important to note it doesn't mean that the whole system is good at everything with relation to it, uh, but we found elements within these categories that were working. Next slide, please. Uh, thank you. So uh, first, um, I know my colleague mentioned that a barrier was transparency. We wanted to highlight that there are elements of transparency that are working. Uh, a few things that are best practices, including the openness of the Citizen Review Committee uh, meetings and the reports that are issued by both IPR and the CRC. Um, we wanted to highlight areas that are accessible and equitable. So the current system does prioritize access and equity through language access. Um, many investigators speak and complete intake in multiple languages. There are, mar are multiple points of entry and employees of PPB uh, they may make complaints outside of their own chain of command. Uh, civilian staff involvement. Uh, the current system has multiple avenues for frontline staff to be involved in the process. Uh, for example, IPR staff can go directly to the scene of deadly force incidents. Uh, civilian staff can, take com uh, can complete intakes and investigations, and civilian staff can mostly do independent investigations and. In um, have no to little subpoena power for documents. Um, 
the qualifications of investigators. Uh, the current system has really experienced investigators. Both IPR and internal investigators work together. They collaborate, team up, consult, um, and share information. Um, all of these investigators have prior investigative experience, um, also uh, specific experience with sex abuse, homicides, criminal, uh, personnel, and administrative investigations. Uh, the we found that the current system offers opportunity uh, for uh, review and rigor. Um, at any point, the investigation can be sent back to the investigator investigator for further examination, um, and an appeal systems is in place for both the uh, employee through the Louderman hearing and the community through the CRC appeal process. Another element of the system that we wanted to highlight is mediation. Uh, the system allows for voluntary mediation as an alternative to investigation for some complaints and also allows for investigations to continue if mediation fall, fails. And finally, outcomes. So beyond the discipline or corrective action for the subject officer, the current system has capacity for other outcomes. Uh, supervisory investigations for low-level complaints, um, and as I mentioned previously, mediation. I'll move to slide seven, please. This slide is included to explain how the PAC's work is organized and when the PAC will get to specific questions. The Commission previously established its phases of work in the agenda and scope document. This quarterly report covers through nearly the end of the fact-finding phase. The fact-finding <coughs> phase ended in October and the next quarterly report will include more on that. Uh, beginning in late October, the Commission began its powers and duties phase in which the functions of the new oversight board and supporting city staff will be defined. Uh, this should be concluding in February. After that, the PAC will determine the structure and details, including membership and appointment of the oversight board. The fifth phase of work will identify a transition plan, as well as how this entire system will fit into the city's uh, the city's current structure or chart and relate to other city entities focused on police and policing. In the concluding phases, we will convert agreements into draft city code text and take additional rounds of input um, from stakeholders and the community before approving a proposal to send to you, the city council. Alongside all of these tasks is the ongoing work of community engagement, which is a key component of our work and crucial to our success. Uh, to anyone watching this live or on video who wants to tell us what you'd like to see in the new system or who'd like to tell us their story about police and police accountability, we have many ways to give input. Um, please go to www.portland.gov slash police dash accountability and click on Get Involved to ensure your voice is a part of the development of Portland's new system. Slide eight, please. Uh, finally, we want to let you know what's happening next. We're currently in our powers and duties phase. Uh, during this time, we're working on developing how the oversight board can get access to information uh, that it needs to do its work, its process for ensuring administrative officer accountability, and finally, how it can conduct structural oversight of PPB, including policy recommendations. Community engagement events are ongoing. We had one last week, and our next one is Tuesday, January 31st on Zoom. To give more detail on this work, our colleagues who began serving as co-chairs after us will come to City Council report to report on next quarter from October to December 2022 in February. Um, thank you for giving us the opportunity to brief you on the work of the PAC through September 2022. Uh, we look forward to continuing our work to honor the will of the voters in creating a new system of accountability, including a new oversight board for Portland Police. We are happy to answer any questions that City Council may have. Samir, does that conclude your presentation? Yeah. Okay. Keelan, I understand we have some public testimony. Why don't we take that next? Uh, first, oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah. First up, we have uh, Mark Porras. Yes, good morning. 
Uh, good morning, Presiding Officer Ryan and Commissioners. For the record, my name is Mark Porras. I use he, him pronouns, and I'm with the group Portland Cop Watch. Uh, the Q3 report does say very generally what the Police Accountability Commission has been working on. Um, however, it takes great pains to describe the number of meetings held and uh, by which people and groups and subcommittees while skipping over almost all of the actual work product of the PAC, other than to say that they created some documents. The report mentions the comings and goings of commissioners uh, and references city ordinances, but omits who left and who joined. So the public needs to wade through city ordinances to find that information. Uh, for the record, the three people who were appointed to the PAC in Q3 were Kiana Olison, Obi Ugwu Oju, and Ajay Amichi. We believe an informative report would at least summarize some of the main findings of these documents and recommendations rather than focusing on the number of meetings. A substantive report to the public and city council would be preferred. We understand why support staff of the PAC can't summarize the work product of the PAC, because that would be a job for the PAC, which should really be the body that is reporting to city council on their own work. And we appreciate that the co-chairs added some needed details today but in general, the written report should similarly include the voices of the PAC members. Thank you. Sorry. Next up, we have Chris Holmquist. And Chris was going to join us in person. Is Chris here? That completes. That's testimony. it. That concludes. Okay. Thanks, Keelan. Colleagues, is there any um, questions or comments you'd like to make at this time? Okay, Commissioner Rubio, good. If there's no more deliberation, can I uh, get a motion to accept the report? So moved. Thanks, Commissioner Mapp. Second? Second. Second by Commissioner Gonzalez. So, Keelan, please call the roll. Rubio. First, I want to thank the PAC commissioners for your leadership <clears throat> and your work. Um, it's very clear here how, how thorough it is and how well you know the material and your dedication really comes through. Um, also want to thank Samir for your stewardship and good work as well. Um, I also want to especially appreciate the conversation that we had when I attended your briefing. Um, we live in a time where public trust in government is suffering, and this presents us with an opportunity to build a system and build trust at the same time. Um, and your work is doing this. It's in, it's incredibly thorough, it's transparent. And what I really want to lift up is how inclusive it's been of all community stakeholders to contribute and participate. So um, we're heading in the right direction and I'm happy to vote aye. Gonzalez. Aye. Maps. Um, I want to thank uh, Samir and the Police Accountability Commission for this report. This is important work and I am glad to accept this report. Ryan. Yeah, first of all, thanks, Samir, and thanks to all three co-chairs. That was a really good report. I also think it's hard to give a report when you're in the rearview mirror so far, so I'm glad I want to acknowledge how uh, quickly you're catching up in terms of the timeliness. I also want to acknowledge how much time you're all putting in. That came up, but I, I've at, I attended one meeting, and it's in the evening, and I think anyone out there that works all day and then goes to a meeting in the evening, and you do this almost, is it weekly? Yes. Yeah. So the amount of uh, volunteer uh, labor, and, and uh, as it was stated by one of the co-chairs, I can't remember which one, the emotional labor that you're going through is a big commitment and a real passion for our city. So thank you so much for your service. Uh, I want to also acknowledge that you're hosting, yeah, 22 meetings, and so that's a big sacrifice. I look forward to re reviewing the final documents and that will address the best practices in the accountability report and also the practices to avoid you're really digging in, and I know I also want to acknowledge my staffer, um, Darian Jones, who attends a lot of those meetings, and uh, I know that for me it's really helpful to get some real-time updates as well. So with all of that, I want to say aye. Thanks. And next, uh, next item, number 40. Appoint Cameron Brown and Sarah Clark. Looks like you all wanted to say one more thing. I just wanted to say one, uh, one more thing in regards to, and we really appreciate the compliments, uh, a story of success for this uh, Police Accountability Commission has been the city and staff support that we've received. Um, it's been immeasurable and hopefully it's a process that really replicates and duplicates itself through other commissions and whatnot. Uh, if it, if uh, uh, it's already kind of starting to do that uh, in a way, but thank you so much for the support. Yeah. 
appoint uh, Cameron Brown and Sarah Clark to the Police Accountability Commission. Okay. I think we need to do an amendment on this one first. Where's the... Colleagues, before we proceed on this with this item, we'll need to move to amend it to reflect that we only be proceeding forward with the appointment of Cameron Brown. That's correct? Okay. As I understand it, there are additional documents are necessary for Ms. Clark's appointment, so her appointment will be brought to the council at a future date. Uh, can, the clerk, can the clerk please call and read the amendment? Do you have the amendment? Okay. No, it, we'll figure this out. <laughs> yeah, the amendment was just to remove um, Sarah Clark from yes. the resolution. Absolutely. So, we so we'll just be voting documented. on one person. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So there, we just read the amendment. Uh, colleagues, do we have any comments and questions before we go further? Do we need a motion on this? Right. Oh, yeah. So moved. So moved by Commissioner Mapp. Second? Second. It's seconded by Commissioner Gonzalez. Any questions, comments? All right, let's do the vote. Rubio. Um, I want to thank um, Eva Vega and Eric Hunter for their service um, on the commission up to this point. Um, and I uh, want to thank them uh, and, and the new commissioner for their volunteering for our city and volunteering their, their time and effort to serve in this way. It's very important. So um, I'm grateful for their service and their, um, their care. Uh, for these reasons, I vote aye. Gonzalez. Aye. Maps. Aye. Ryan. Aye. Okay, now we can go ahead with the vote on the motion on the on the appointment. Or right, Samir, you want to give you want to give a presentation. Just Great. a brief one, yeah. Thanks. Uh, so the, the commission began its work uh, in December 2021, um, having uh, active members and filled positions is, is really important to the commission to help it achieve its goals on time. Um, as you can see in the document, a member unfortunately recently resigned, which created a vacancy. Um, as our co-chairs mentioned, uh, the commission is working hard on developing powers and duties of the new oversight board and accountability system and is about to uh, you know, shift and is in the process of developing powers duties um, for the for city council review. Um, as you'll see in February, we'll have more information on that when the, the next round of co-chairs report on the October to December period. Um, for this vacancy, there were well over 100 members who applied uh, for the commission, the original solicitation, um, and were reached out to uh, to see if they were still interested and eligible uh, for the for the commission. Council uh, worked very hard and wanted to commend all of the council staff and offices for working together to uh, come to the conclusion of, of appointment of, of this individual, uh, which continues the collaboration of all of the council offices related to this commission. Um, the appointee, Cameron Brown, is with us on um, Zoom, so I'd like to pass it to Cameron to introduce himself. Right. Hi, I'm Cameron Brown, um, lifelong resident of uh, Portland, Oregon. I've uh, born and raised in Northeast Portland. Um, I'm a freelance photographer. Um, I'm my own little business, and uh, I do lots of different kind of uh, work uh, throughout the community in that vein, um, but uh, I, you know, I've, I've I've tried to be part of the community here in Portland, and um, you know, interact with um, you know the local community um, in my neighborhood and beyond, um, and I'm 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 very excited to. Uh, be part of um, this organization. Thank you, Cameron. Thank you. Anything else, Samir? No, that concludes the presentation. Okay. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Is there any uh, public testimony for the nomination? Yes, we have one person signed up, Mark Porras. Okay, let's go ahead and, and hear from Mark. Mark, you there? Yep, good morning again, presiding officer Ryan and commissioners. For the record, my name is Mark Porras. I use he, him pronouns, and I'm with the group Portland Cop Watch. We have no objection to the addition of Cameron Brown to the Police Accountability Commission. We likely would have had no objection to the addition of Sarah Clark to the commission. Um, however, we noticed last night that there will only be one new member added today. Uh, the commission has been missing two members since Eric Hunter and Ava Vega resigned several months ago meaning that there were only 18 members and quorum should have been 10 people. 
but instead the PAC had to wait until 10, 11 members uh, were present to conduct business. We've been asking uh, council for a resolution to allow all city commissions to set their quorums to a majority of seated and active members. Like a bad penny you can't throw away, here I am again today asking you to make this happen. The Police Accountability Commission sent you all a letter in June of last year with this very request, which would allow the important work that they and other city commissions are doing to continue in the face of the inevitable membership turnover that occurs on these volunteer boards. Yes, we would love it if the commission was always promptly restocked when someone resigns. However, when those replacements aren't made promptly and meetings are sometimes canceled or delayed due to missing quorum, the volunteers are unable to do the important work that they have volunteered to do. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. That completes testimony. Thank you. Okay, now we can go ahead and vote on this item. All right. Rubio. For all the reasons I stated before, <laughs> I have to vote aye. Gonzalez. Aye. Maps. I want to thank Cameron for agreeing to serve on this important committee. I vote aye. Ryan. Yeah, thank you, Cameron, for agreeing to sit on, on this very active committee and also for giving a little bit of a, a testimony about your life story here in Portland. It's especially uh, noted that you're a small business owner, which is a great uh, representation to have at the table. I vote aye. Uh, next item, uh, 41, a Align Police Accountability Commission with timeline under U.S. Department of Justice Settlement Agreement. Yeah, we're going to refer this back to the mayor's office. That concludes uh, those items. Thank you so much. Thank you all for your time. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you all for being here. Okay, let's go to item 42. <coughs> Declare as surplus city-owned property located at the corner of Southwest Council Crest Drive and Southwest McDonald Terrace and authorize the Director of the Bureau of Environmental Services to proceed with a public sale of the property. Okay, it's my pleasure to turn this over to Commissioner Maps. Take it away. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer Ryan. Colleagues, this item comes to us from the Bureau of Environmental Services. With this ordinance, BES seeks council's approval to dispose of a piece of surplus property located at the corner of Southwest Council Crest Drive and Southwest McDonald Terrace. This property is a vacant lot, which covers about 8,000 square feet of very steep terrain. It was acquired by the city in 2006 with the intent to sell. And environmental services has no use for this land. This property has gone through the city's disposition process and no city bureau has expressed interest in this property. The sale of this property is expected to bring in around $60,000. That price is so low because this lot is small and steep, which makes it difficult to build on. Um, I'll close by asking and answering this question, um, which I'm sure many of you have in your mind right now. Can this property be used for affordable housing? And the answer is no. While it is theoretically possible to build housing on this land because this terrain is so steep, by the time you pay for the engineering needed to build on this plot of land, the housing you create will no longer be affordable. Uh, here to tell us more about this ordinance, we have Virginia Bowers, Property uh, Coordinator with the Bureau of Environmental Services, and we also have Deputy City Attorney Eric Schaffner, uh, should we have any questions about the legal issues involved with this um, item. Welcome, Virginia and Eric. Thanks. Um, and actually, this is Eli Kellison. Oh. Probably know him, too. <laughs> um, there is a map, I'm um, hoping that we can post so you can see the location of the property. Um, as Commissioner Maps mentioned, the property was acquired as part of a settlement uh, with the intention to resell, to recoup the settlement cost. Um, BS doesn't have any use or any goals for this property. There is a storm sewer that runs along the northeast side um, that will have an easement over it. That's just for uh, the easements for maintenance to the storm pipe. Um, this is the fourth excess property that BS has recently brought to the council to uh, be declared surplus. 
Um, the only other thing I want to mention um, that's come up several times that during the public comment period, uh, several folks have referred to uh, an agreement that prohibits the city from selling. Um, and just staff would like to just say that we have done research um, and we've found no reference to this agreement. Um, and in the ordinance itself, uh, it clearly states that the city should be authorized to resell the property. Um, so with that, um, here to answer any questions as we go through. Yeah, but before that, we can see if there's any public testimony. Yeah, yeah. Kayla? Yes, we have some people signed up. Uh, first up, we have Preetha Krishnan. Uh, she's joining us virtually. Okay. If you all just uh, make room for the testimony, then come back. But stay around. Yeah. I'll stay here? Meaning stay in the chamber. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. and Krishnan's on mine there. There she is. Can you guys hear me okay? Yeah. yeah, we can hear you. Thank you. My name is Preetha Krishnan, and I am whew, a little nervous. Um, <laughs> I am the neighbor uh, right next uh, to that empty lot. Um, I think my concerns are really regarding two aspects. Um, many of our houses are on stilt foundations. And um, the property next door has already had a landslide. And I worry that any development there, especially since you know, pile foundations, et cetera, will need to be drilled, will adversely affect the surrounding houses, especially mine, since I'm right next door. Um, I also worry that um, any uh, large structure will have slide potential simply because of the prior slide. I know that there's a retaining wall there now and that there hasn't been a slide there, but I wonder how much of that is because nothing has been built in that place. Um, the second concern is really regarding the construction. Um, I don't know if detritus is the right word, but really all of the things that go along with construction. We, we live um, in small windy roads. Um, there are already some potholes. Um, I worry about how construction equipment will limit access. I worry about how this affects um, kind of the stability of the roads. Um, and I, I think, you know, Com uh, Commissioner Rubio, a, a bit ago, you had mentioned that unfortunately there seems to be this pervasive um, lack of trust in, in city government. And I, I think that that pervasiveness uh, extends to many aspects, um, including whether or not the, the city, if it, if it opts to sell to someone who builds on this lot, um, how much oversight will there be? You know, how much ownership will the city take? And um, I, I, I think I just worry about the, the safety of our, our houses. It's my home um, and it's, it's, it's hard, uh, it's, it's very difficult think that my home is not safe. Um, and so, you know, I, I don't know if there's a right or wrong answer here. Um, I'm simply hoping that if you opt to sell this property, that you take these concerns um, and perhaps have a compromise or, or a solution there. Thank you so much. Thank you, Preetha. You did a great job. I know you said you're nervous, but it was, you did fine. Um, any other testimony? Great. Yeah, next up we have Fred Spada in person. I'm the son of the parents you guys went against in court, and I have two signed testimonies that they saw that settlement agreement. One of them is from, both of them are very credible witnesses. The first one, my name is John Skirties, and in my specialty is real estate, commercial development, and construction. I have over 50 years experience in those areas. I hold many properties and warehouses, farmland, dental clinics. I have known George Spada since 1988. After the landslide from the flood of 96, Mr. Spada sought my advice on how to approach reforcing the lot in Council Crest. During the lawsuit between the Spadas and the city, Mr. Spada sought my advice beyond his attorney during those 10 years of legal hassles. In 2006, when the city approached Mr. Spada and his attorney for a settlement, Mr. Spada contacted me and I told him to put in the settlement agreement beyond no further action legally will be pursued between both parties unless the settlement agreement was in breach that the property can never be developed or sold. My reasoning for telling him to do that, since the city would never grant a permit to build because the city declared the 
property unbuildable as a way to force the spadas to settle out of court, then that makes the property worthless, so there is no reason to sell it. I told Mr. Spada if the city signs off on this, I wanted to see the settlement agreement after it was signed by the city and notarized. In late Ju July 2006, while working on the roof of one of my properties, Mr. Spada stopped by to show me a copy of the settlement agreement. In attendance was my nephew as he was assisting on the roof. On the settlement agreement, I specifically remember seeing the language stating that the spadas cannot pursue any further legal action against the city and the city cannot develop or sell the lot. As an NBA fan, I know the city attorney who signed it on behalf of the city because he had the same last name as the legendary coach from the Boston Celtics. I also looked over the bill of sale to the deed of the lot as it was a sec separate document. From his nephew, my name is Dan Skirties and I will testify on behalf of the spade as a court. I was assisting my uncle in late July 2006 working on the roof of my properties. I remember very vividly Mr. Spade is stopping by. He handed me some documents. My per uncle purposely pointed me out the settlement agreement between me and the cities on Council Crest. And there's more to it, but to get Basically, the bottom line is because you guys have lost that document, I contacted the State Archives, the Secretary of State. You are in violation of OAR 166-200-0275, subsection 1, OAR 166-020-007, subsection 2, and ORS 162305. So not only, so we will pursue a lawsuit because you, if you even think about selling this property, uh, in full agreement as the, the ways you guys tried to play and force us out of the lot. And since we have two testimonial witnesses regarding that they did see this, we will pursue this in full court. Thank you. May I ask uh, a yeah, yeah. Commissioner Gonzalez wanted Can to make a comment. Uh, so I just want to clarify, has there been anything recorded against uh, either this property or adjoining property with respect to no sell obligation? You can come back only, up here. The only thing you guys sent me was the bill of sale. The point is, every attorney, even a city attorney, would want to make sure that there is a uh, settlement agreement that we will not pursue any further action on this deal. Now, it already went through the whole Supreme Court process by you guys trying to pull an eminent domain, and the Supreme Court said no. So through this whole process, you guys pulled all these stunts on us, on my parents. They went through 10 years of hell. And then all of a sudden you have the, the gumption to come back and say, we're not going to grant you a permit to build because it's unbuildable. Well, I got two testimonial witnesses here saying they saw that separate, they saw that settlement agreement because one of them was the one that told my dad to put that in there. So now you guys have lost a document that you are required by state law to maintain. And the state archivist has told me, you guys here in the city of Portland have a tendency to really bend those rules. Well, I'm going to hold you accountable to those rules. I'm going to hold you accountable to that settlement agreement, and these guys will testify in court because the one witness who I just told, his name is John Skirties, and let me give you the credibility of this witness. The bottom line is he and his brother own a company called Willamette Dental Group, and I'm sure you know all the, all the clinics around town, and also they're great philanthropists because the dental school, they contributed $10 million to OHSU to build what's called the Skirties Dental School. No, thanks so, for your testimony. It's going over a little bit. D did you get your question answered, Commissioner Gonzalez? I think we'll just, I think when, I want to make sure we review title for both this property and joining property. This is more than a title. This is a separate, this is a settlement agreement beyond the bill of title. Maybe your office can get in touch. Yeah, okay. we'll be in touch. Can Thank we go you. on to the next testimony? Uh, next up we have Mari Marietta Spada. Hi, I'm Marietta Spada. Thank you for being here. Uh, we were the owners of the lot on Council Crest and McDonald Terrace at, that had the slide. <clears throat> we purchased in 95. The slide was in 96, the largest slide in Portland. We went through 10 years of litigation. Our attorney contacted us in 2006 and said the city would like to settle because um, they're ready. So we went to the attorney, he said they want to settle, and we said to finalize it because we could have gone on for further litigation. It was in our favor, but after 10 years, it gets a little old and tired, and it was very stressful during that time. If you have any questions that maybe I can answer for you, 
I'd be happy to. Thank you, Marianne. You good? Thank you for your time. Yeah. Thanks for being here. Uh, next up, we have Pat Wall. Pat, there you are. Welcome. Welcome. You got a hot mic there. You got three minutes. Hi. Hi, my name is Patricia Wall, and we have lived in the neighborhood that we're talking about um, for over 40 years. Uh, we were there when the Spada's lot went down the hill, and it happened early in the morning. It was like a prehistoric sound, and it horrified us. I thought it was a garbage truck, but my husband pointed out it was only 4.30 in the morning. It couldn't be. But um, I am, um, and I should have said good morning. I'm a little nervous. Anyway, um, I, I wanted to, um, to talk about the value of the property to our neighborhood. Uh, a lot of people who go jogging and, and go, are driving, people drive up there, park there, because they can still see the city from there. There are so many other lots that have been built that you can't see the city. And um, when the landslide came, um, it, was, it was just shocking to us, and there were a lot of uh, things going on because we were concerned about the spadas and what had happened because that was the lot that they were planning to build their dream house on. And uh, under the circumstances, since I have been researching this, um, I think it really is unconscionable uh, for the city to think about selling this lot. And the reason I do is because uh, we also talked about, um, you know, the settlement agreement. <clears throat> and we talked to the Spadas after this had happened. And uh, it was not supposed to be built on. And they said never would it be built on, that it was unbuildable. And they would not ever grant a permit to build. And um, that really sort of... I think threatened the spadas. They couldn't do anything about it, and and um, I felt that uh, they um, were also told by the city. And I I would like for you to to tell me if this is right. Go ahead and improve the lot or do something about it. It was dangerous and a hazard, and um, obviously they did not apply then for a building permit because. You know, so you wouldn't go ahead, as I mentioned before, and try and get a building permit if you were told it wouldn't be granted, would you? Patricia, thank you for being here. You're a little over time, so if you could okay. wrap up and, well, and if you have I just want to finish because because well. I know when I was sitting through number 41, it was quite interesting, but it was pretty long, and so I'd, I'd like to finish what I'm saying, and I'll try and yeah. speed yeah, it yeah, up. Yeah, you have three minutes, mm -hmm. and we'll, we'll and, give you um, on four. Yeah. Anyway, I, I understand that the city also oversaw some easements for two lines on both sides of the property, and that was in December 6th of 2022. Now, that would mean to me that the city is setting up to try and get the property sold. But why would you sell property for $60,000 when you've already spent over $2 million? It doesn't make any sense. Thanks, Patricia. And it also doesn't make sense since the water. Yeah, we'll I just want to make person. this other statement. Yes, because I came all the way down here to do this. Yeah, everyone does. Yeah. yeah. The next person to testify. Thanks so much. Next up, we have Mason Van Buren. Oh, you don't have to do that. Got it. Thanks so much. Thank you. Welcome. Welcome. I think you'll be in a lot of trouble because I know it's got to be somewhere and everybody has been looking for it. Okay. And there is a settlement agreement out there. Thanks so much, Patricia. I, I Can you call? I would ask that the city find a settlement agreement. Next up, we have Mason Van Buren. Oh, you don't have to do that. Got it. Okay. Thanks so much. Thank you. Welcome. Hi. Welcome. The mic is on when you sit down. The clock will begin. It's great to have you here. Please state your name for the record. I'm sorry, I can't hear oh, you. Please state your name for the me. record. I'm getting there. 
when you Wilhelm owned a lot. He lived where Patsy Wall lives now, uh, Kitty Corner. And he gave us permission to, this is before greens buckets on the side of the road, he gave us permission to dump all our greens over the edge of the bank. So there was, you know, lawn clippings, hedge clippings, and um, thing, anyway. Also, what happened during that time was every time a new house was built and they dug out the basement, the dirt from that basement, the clay soil, would be tossed over the edge as well, a free dumping for the. So you had layers and layers of greens, dirt, greens, dirt, uh, probably which helped make the slide happen where it changed its name from the dump to the slide lot. This area has been kind of a community gathering space. Uh, it has a beautiful view of the city. Uh, back in the 50s when you could burn leaves, it was the neighborhood space where everybody would bring their leaves and burn them and chit chat around the fire. It's the place where we all viewed Mount St. Helens blowing up time and time and time again. Um, I brought a picture today of the lunar eclipse that happened in 2015. I don't know how we pass this around, clerk. How do I pass this to them so that they can see on one side, there's the gathering and on one side. It's, it's not only just the neighborhood, it's the whole city that came up and parked and looked out over this um, over the city to watch the lunar eclipse. This happens uh, with a supermoon. Uh, it's also a neighborhood gathering place when it's 4th of July. We look right down McDonald. Uh, we sit up at that top area and have fireworks, and then we watch the Blues Festival fireworks, which we can see. Um, oftentimes there's a bench sitting out there because it's the place where the school kids get off the bus and the parents sit and wait for them on the bench. Neighbors without the, uh, which have a Tualatin Valley view come over to see Mount Hood to see if it has snow on it so they can go skiing. Numbers of walkers, oops, hikers and uh, people on the 4T trail, dog walkers, photo photographers and young lovers all enjoy that space. So one of the options was to leave it as an open space uh, for the community. It has a very small impact on the city budget to sell this. It has a big impact on the neighborhood community and all the citizens of Portland. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks for coming down to testify. Uh, Keelan, are there any that more? That completes okay. testimony. How many more? I'm just curious. I'm sorry. How many more are testifying? Oh, uh, that concludes testimony. Oh, that concludes testimony. testimony. Yep. Okay. Sorry. Thank you so much. Uh, thank President. you for your service to the Healy Heights Neighborhood Association. Eva. Uh, so, uh, Commissioner Maps, you and the team want to? Yeah, President yeah. Ryan, if I may, uh, let me first start off by um, thanking everyone who showed up today to testify on this item. Uh, you raise a lot of important questions, and I, um, I'd like to take this moment to invite city staff uh, to respond to some of the issues that were raised today, if that um, is okay with you. I think that makes a lot of sense. Okay, so I will turn it over, back over to um, our panel. Actually, I, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that Eric could address the court uh, decision. I don't believe it did go to the Supreme Court. Um, there's yep. that process. Good morning, Commissioners. Eric Schaffner, City Attorney's Office. Um, I, I can address some of what was uh, raised. Uh, the first of all, again, we we've not seen any settlement agreement. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean that what doesn't exist, but we haven't seen it. And the evidence that we do have uh, strongly indicates uh, a contrary conclusion. We have an ordinance, which, as Virginia mentioned, uh, was pretty clear that it was pretty clear that uh, the property is being acquired with the intent to sell. Uh, we have to answer uh, Commissioner Gonzalez's question. I think a bargain and sale deed was had no deed restrictions. Uh, I've reviewed the uh, testimony from council hearing that date, and no one testified one way or the other. So there's no helpful information there. So. All, 
all we really have is what we can see if uh, property owners or anyone else uh, has something written that we can look at, we're more than happy to see that. In the meantime, though, uh, I think that the Bureau's uh, uh, position is that keeping this property longer doesn't benefit the city. Uh, so I think that the, the sale, uh, as a legal matter, I see no impediment to moving forward. May I ask a quick clarification? Yes, absolutely, Commissioner Have Gonzalez. we done a title abstract or any other uh, general review of title a as a part of your process? There's a title report. Yes. Oh, okay, yeah. and, and so no covenants, uh, no nothing? Okay, no. got it. No. Got it. Um, um, and just to clarify in terms of where we are in the process, you and I'm, I'm only been here a few days, so I wanna clarify the process. So you've declared it surplus, you are, uh, or wh where are we in the process right. with respect to this property? Um, so it was declared, Excess. Mm -hmm. Let me get the terminology. Um, Commissioner Maps, um, there's a, your exhibit, I think it's B or something, um, is where the commissioner declares it excess. Um, and then at that point, we have a 60 day, had a 60 day public comment period. Um, that's where we got a lot of this information. Um, and the neighbors heard about it. We post a sign. Um, that is since closed. Um, the next step then is to um, come bring to council, we delayed that a little bit just because there was so so much controversy and we were looking at the documents that we had and doing some research. Um, like uh, We did find out that um, actually, um, it was uh, Mr. Van Buren um, told you about all the lawn debris and um, that apparently that is what slid. There was, I think, 14 feet of sort of unconsolidated material is, which is what actually went down the hill. Um, it, from one of the neighbors, there's a letter from the geotech to Mr. Spada, kind of outlining what would need to happen for a geotech report. He also mentioned that, um, that debris, pile of debris. Um, there's a letter from the Bureau of Development Services after the slide. Uh, saying that they needed to fix that. It wasn't anything to do with building. It was just that it, as it stood, uh, it was a hazardous situation. Um, and that's about all, all we know um, because then there's the court case um, that was settled. We paid 450,000 to the Spadas and in exchange, we ended up with the property. That's my understanding. Um, since I believe that uh, the property has been um, shored up, I don't know, know if the city did that. Um, there's some gabions and things like that that kind of stabilize the, the slope. Um, in, in just next steps. Yes, the, um, so um, there's, a, it requires to be a second reading uh, a month and there's 30 days before it's, um, your decision is uh, enacted, and then from there we can market the property. Um, okay, and, yeah. and so uh, and, and, at, oh, go ahead. I did a really quick follow-up um, to that. So we're following the city disposition process, which um, re re we're considering this a category three. Um, within that process, after it's declared surplus, we have to wait for 30 days. We have to post a sign on the area for 30 days um, to ensure that anybody that might be interested in the site has time to find it. Um, the location where we're at right now is we're asking you to declare it surplus. We've done, Commissioner Maps can declare access to Bureau needs, um, which we've done. We've determined we don't need it. There's no BES interest in the site, so we're asking to remove it. Um, after the Commissioner declares the access to Bureau needs, there's a 21-day process that other city bureaus can review the site. Um, so we've gone through that step. Nobody was interested in it. After the city staff review it, then we go out for public commentary. After public commentary, we come to you. So we're at the step, we just finished public commentary and are asking to move the next step forward. Um, so just to kind of fine line that, um, everybody has seen it and then within the city, and then after, um, if you choose to say yes, we move forward with the sale, then there's a 30 day mandatory period for um, posting it um, for sale. Extremely helpful. And one last question. So there is nothing that precludes potentially neighbors working together to acquire this piece of property? Not at all. Uh, okay. So I, I would encourage those testifying today to at least think about the scenario, uh, even if the city proceeds in a way that you're unhappy about, there is an opportunity for neighbors to team up 
and acquire the property. And you know, in my legal career, we did this a number of times to preserve property for neighborhood use. Um, it's a you know, I, I, we're relying we're relying on the our 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 staff's review of the records as best they can to determine the facts on the ground. And uh, you know, I'm not going to prejudge how we're going to vote, but um, I'm just encouraging you to consider that as an option. This is a, this is a tool that neighbor and happy to reach out to my office. If you feel free to reach out to my office, and I can kind of give you some guidance on how you might work together as a team to acquire the property. Pro property should we go forward with this? So. Just leave that at that, and I appreciate you all testifying. Thank you all for your Thank you for joining the team. Thanks for being here. This, uh, this will now move on uh, to the second reading. Thanks. Thanks. Keelan, let's go to the consent agenda, items 43 through 52. This is the written testimony. Um, for the consent agenda, yes. you want to call Yeah, it? do it all at once. Yeah. Rubio. We're now voting Aye. on the consent agenda, colleagues. Aye. Gonzalez. Aye. Maps. Aye. Ryan. Aye. Okay, on to item 53. Please read item 53. Back to the regular agenda. Thanks again for your testimony and for being here. Ratifying letter of agreement Ratify letter of agreement between the city and the Portland Police Command Officers Association to settle an unfair labor practice complaint. Yes, colleagues, this ordinance re resolves an unfair labor practice complaint from the Portland Police Commanders Officers Association. Chief Deputy City Attorney Heidi Brown is here to walk us through the ordinance. Welcome to the dais, Heidi. Thank you, Commissioner Ryan. Good morning, Council. Heidi Brown, Chief Deputy um, City Attorney. And I'm here on this letter of agreement between the Portland Police Association, Command Officers Association, excuse me, and the City of Portland. Um, just briefly, this, this agreement simply requires the city to follow the law regarding collective bargaining. And um, in exchange for us agreeing to follow the law regarding collective bargaining and acknowledging that that law exists and providing notice to the union of when we intend to implement the oversight board, um, they will dismiss an unfair labor practice complaint, uh, a lawsuit before the Employment Relations Board that is currently pending. Uh, this language mimics the language that we already have in the collective bargaining agreement between the city and the Portland Police Association. Um, it's just that the unfair labor practice complaints were filed both by the PPA and by the PPCOA. So if uh, council adopts this, this will fully resolve the complaints that are currently pending. Are there any questions I can answer or would you like more information about what this does and why it's before you? Uh, any uh, questions from colleagues? Otherwise, first I want to look to Keelan. Is there any public testimony? Yeah, we have one person signed up. Why don't Mark we listen to that next? Okay. Mark Porras. Mark, you there? Yeah, I'm here. Thanks. Uh, good morning, Presiding Officer Ryan and Commissioners. For the record, my name is Mark Porras. I use he, him pronouns, and I'm with the group Portland Cop Watch. Uh, this agreement with the Portland Police Commanding Officers Association, the PPCOA, mirrors language in the rank and file Portland Police Association contract saying the police don't agree with the city's interpretation of the state law passed in 2021. To recap, that law said a city can establish an oversight board through a vote to the charter without negotiating, but it doesn't say that the way the board functions does not have to be negotiated. Now, while it would be nice to imagine a world where the police are going to agree to implement the will of 82% of Portlanders who voted in 2020 for the new oversight system to show good faith, it's more likely than not that they're gonna demand certain items envisioned in the charter are mandatory for bargaining. Portland Cop Watch fully supports the rights of workers to negotiate for fair working conditions. However, we feel that the two police associations have too much power to influence policies that elected officials should be setting. So while it's not being contemplated in today's vote, we hope that the city will encourage the PPCOA and the PPA as well to engage in an ongoing dialogue with the Police Accountability Commission. This ongoing dialogue will help the Police Accountability Commission design a system that's fair to police, 
but also meets the expectations of a community which in 2020 became acutely aware and powerfully vocal about racial injustice and other systemic problems with policing. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. Colleagues, do you have any questions or comments? Okay, this is, uh, this is an emergency ordinance. And colleagues, if there's no more deliberation on the item, can I get a motion to accept? So moved. So moved by Commissioner Mapp. Second. Second. Second by Commissioner Gonzalez. Keelan, please call the roll. Rubio. Aye. Gonzalez. Aye. Mapps. Aye. Ryan. Aye. Okay, let's go to item 54, Keelan. Thank you. Ratify a collective bargaining. Thank you. Colleagues, this collective bargaining agreement secures a labor agreement with AFSCME, ASME, Local 189 through June 30th, 2025. The agreement establishes wage scales for a variety of classifications and seeks to improve retention within the Office of Independent Police Review via cost of living increases and bonuses. Labor Relations Manager Jarrell Gaddis is here to walk us through the ordinance. Welcome, Jarrell. Welcome, uh, Commissioner Ryan, and welcome, Commissioners. Happy New Year to you all. Um, I am here uh, seeking counsel um, authority to ratify this collective bargaining agreement. Um, this is a bargain agreement that originated, it's its first a bargain agreement for this um, unit. Um, it originated out of the auditor's office and as of July 1, um, uh, became its own independent um, bargaining unit. This bargaining unit um, is a classification of four different classifications with only currently 11 um, employees. Um, the director um, of that um, independent um, police review uh, office is Ross Caldwell. Uh, he assists me um, in the bargaining of this contract. Um, the items I'm going to talk about are basically the um, high level ones. Um, this is a three year agreement. Um, a part of this three year agreement, um, the uh, director Caldwell wanted to um, maintain um, a consistent staffing and uh, continuity. And so a part of that, um, we negotiated a um, incentive to continue on for the next three years. Um, that incentive was $3,000 for the first year, $3,000 for the second year, three and $3,500 for the third year. In addition to that, um, we, we moved from a pay range um, that was established for non-represented employees into a step system that was um, established for this uh, collective bargaining unit. Uh, the census, this step system um, consists of nine steps in which a person plateaus at um, the ninth year of um, being in the classification. Um, uh, the cost, um, the cost of this um, contract was one hundred and thirteen thousand dollars. Will um, be the final cost in uh, fiscal year twenty four twenty five. Um, just to give you a little rough figures, it was $35,000 for uh, the retention and $78,000 um, for changing the classification rate and uh, moving it to a step system. Um, I will let uh, Director Caldwell uh, provide any added information he would like. Thank you. Uh, good morning, council members. I'm Ross Caldwell, the director at Independent Police Review. I just wanted to echo what uh, Jarrell said, and I think that the intent of this is really just to keep IPR employees working as uh, the Police Accountability Commission, who you heard from earlier this morning, as they complete their work and uh, the new system is the, the new police accountability system is designed. Uh, I think this will help keep IPR employees working and, and keep us in compliance with the Department of Justice settlement agreement uh, as a continued oversight system uh, is mandatory under that agreement until we can move to the next system and that's up and running and fully off the ground. So thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, uh, do we have any uh, public testimony? Okay. We have one person signed up, Mark Porras. Mark, you're back. Yep, I'm back, it's still morning. So. Uh, 
Good morning again, Presiding Officer Ryan and Commissioners. For the record, my name is Mark Porras. I use he, him pronouns, and I'm with the group Portland Cop Watch. Um, as, as noted in our testimony on the PPCOA contract, uh, Portland Cop Watch fully supports the rights of workers to negotiate for fair working conditions. Um, it, it is notable that in our cursory review of this 73 page document, the staff at the um, IPR are not demanding that their labor contract affects the policies of the agency they're working for, nor the city that employs them. Unlike the PPA and PPCOA, these workers are seeking stable income and working hours and other workplace guarantees that most any other worker would ask for. It's particularly important that the IPR staff is taking these steps, albeit as the agency is being phased out, because until the new review board is in place, IPR is all that stands between the public and a complaint system where the only people investigating police are other police. As much as we've criticized the IPR for certain decisions it's made and the inadequate power they've been given, it's important to have a civilian oversight body that functions and whose staff is treated with dignity and respect. Commissioner Gonzalez, in your Willamette Week hot seat interview when asked this question about PPA, the police union has historically pushed back against sending more non-emergency calls to Portland Street Response. Would you go against the police union in that way? You replied, I didn't know the police union was opposed to more of those calls going to PSR. If more calls are appropriate for PSR, absolutely. I don't know if any public safety bureau should have a veto on what makes sense. I wanna understand more about the police's opposition to that. Uh, the Portland Police Association wrote in a letter of agreement for Portland Street Response in its 2022 to 2025 contract that they will have four representatives on the 16 member body that decides what PSR can and cannot do, two members of police and two dispatchers. They therefore have more representation than any other group on that committee. After years complaining that they have to run from call to call and don't have time to handle people in mental health crisis, once PSR was set up as an alternative, the PPA suddenly took the stance of complaining that work is being taken away from them. They don't want, for instance, PSR to approach people inside buildings or in the street, two places that people in mental health crisis are often found. Hmm. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. That, that wraps up public one. testimony. Okay, colleagues, any questions? Okay, this is an emergency, emergency ordinance. If there's no more deliberation on this item, Keelan, please call the roll. Rubio. Um, I'm pleased that everyone involved um, in this has come to an agreement. These workers have been waiting for a very long time for resolution, and I want to appreciate their patience and their desire to continuing uh, to continue to serve the city of Portland. I vote aye. Gonzalez. Aye. Maps. Aye. Ryan. Aye. Okay, motion passes. Let's go on to item 55. Pay settlement of Dorothy Hart property damage claim for $89,105 involving the Portland Water Bureau. This ordinance re resolves a claim brought against the city in September of 2022. Senior claims analyst Joseph Jesse is here to walk us through the ordinance. Welcome, Joseph. Good morning, Council. Um, so this ordinance relates to a water service line that cracked on or around August 30th, 2022, and began leaking into the claimant's basement. This crack occurred on the city side line about a foot away from the property owner's water meter. This is a unique circumstance because typically a water leak from a service line would find its way to a catchment system, but due to the location of this line, no system that would typically mitigate the amount of water reaching the residents existed. A water remediation company began work on Ms. Hart's residence to address the extensive mold and bacteria growth that had occurred over the several weeks since the claimant first noticed the leak. The costs associated with this ordinance will pay for the extensive remediation work, restoration work, and damaged items that were in Ms. Hart's basement at the time of the incident. Thank you, Joseph. Keelan, is there any public testimony? No one signed up. Okay, colleagues, do you have any comments or questions at this time? All right, this is another emergency ordinance. And colleagues, if there's no more deliberation, then Keelan, please call the roll. Rubio. Aye. Gonzalez. Aye. Maps. Aye. Ryan. Aye. Okay, motion passes. Let's, or, uh, ordinance passes. Let's go on to 56. Pay settlement of Eric Hufnagel bodily injury lawsuit for $75,000 involving the Portland Police Bureau. Colleagues, this ordinance resolves a claim brought against the city in September of 2022. Am I reading the same thing or is it just that, Jesse, you're back to do this one as well? Yes. Jesse, just take it away. Um, and uh, Caroline Turco. Caroline, with, okay. The city attorney's office and she'll, she'll be presenting on this. Good morning. 
This case involves a police use of force during the George Floyd protests in the summer of 2020. This incident occurred on July 4th, 2020 in downtown Portland near the intersection of 4th and Washington. The plaintiff, Mr. Hoofnagel, was marching with protesters when a smoke canister rolled past him. He turned around and kicked the smoke canister in the direction of the police. And when he did that, he was fired upon multiple times with multiple different munitions. He injured his knee and sustained bruises and later experienced emotional injuries. Mr. Hoofnagel filed this lawsuit against the city PPB officer Brent Taylor, Multnomah County, and Multnomah County officer Kyle Smith. The parties attended mediation with Marion County, excuse me, retired Marion County Judge Pamela Abernathy and reached a mutually agreeable settlement. Under the settlement, the city will pay $75,000 to Mr. Hofnagel for his injuries and his attorney fees. Okay, thank you, Caroline. Thank you, Joseph. And that wraps up your presentation? Yes. Sounds good. Any public testimony? We have uh, two people signed up for this item. For up is Mark Porras. Welcome back, Mark. Thank you. Last time you'll see me today. Good morning, Pres Presiding Officer Ryan and Commissioners. My name is Mark Porras. I use he, him pronouns, and I'm with the group Portland Cop Watch. Uh, we have no objection to the city paying this settlement, which is the result of unconstitutional police violence committed by Officer Brent Taylor of the Portland Police Bureau on July 4th, 2020. We do, however, ask you to help the public understand the true cost of policing by including the amount of time and money spent by city attorneys and risk management on police misconduct settlements. And we ask you again to stop using the term encounter in the ordinance language when a cop brutalizes a community member. Um, please watch this 50 second video of Mr. Hoofnagel's encounter uh, where you'll see a peaceful demonstrator's life being changed at the hands of the Portland Police Bureau within the first 15 seconds. I believe the council clerk can play that video now. It's coming. Okay, great, thank you. Um, give me just a minute, we're checking with um, our broadcaster. Okay, Keelan's on it. Yep, thanks. Should we go to the next testimony and then get this set up? Mark, you good with that? Um, no, it's important for us to show the video. Uh, oh, no, we'll show it. I, I just Mr. want to make sure we get it queued up. No one likes dead time. Yeah. Yep. Well, yeah. Be nice if the city attorney's office would display it as well. What do you suggest? Yeah, we may need to pause a moment to... I got an idea. It's getting close to that time to take a five-minute break. Let's go ahead and do that. Council will be returned in five minutes. Thanks.
January 18th, 2023 is back in session. We were in the middle of testimony on item 56. Mark Porras, you're back on. Round two, you ready? Round two, ready. Uh, thank you. I'm assuming you can see the screen. Yes, we can see it. Okay, I'm gonna hit play on here. I'm not sure if you're gonna get the sound though, but here we go. Recording in progress. Um, thank you. I'm assuming that uh, you all caught that. So in the video, you saw Mr. Hoofnagel walking away with, with the crowd from the line of riot cops when officers fired a smoking canister towards them. He kicked the canister away from the crowd, took a couple steps backwards away from the cops, was shot, fell to the ground, and then shot in the back multiple times. <laughs> This video could be used in an unconstitutional policing 101 course. Mr. Hoofnagel did nothing wrong. He kicked a smoking canister away from the crowd and attempted to continue on his way following orders from police to disperse. For this, he received a shattered kneecap, multiple impact weapons shots in the back and a violent takedown. He was arrested and held in jail overnight in the middle of the COVID-19 pandemic. What you can't see in the video is how Officer Taylor described the unjustifiable incident in his report, where he stated that Mr. Hoofnagel was able to retrieve the canister and throw it at officers. We all saw the video and it's quite clear that Officer Taylor lied in his reports. How can the city continue to employ an officer who performs unconstitutional policing and then lies about it? We bring these issues up during police misconduct settlements, despite understanding that these settlements are a done deal in an attempt to get you to engage and discuss the underlying policy issues around police misconduct. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Colleagues, any comments or questions? Oh, there's more, there's one other testimony. Okay. Yes, we All right, have sorry. one other person uh, for testimony, Van Handelman. Uh, good morning, uh, can you hear me at all? Yes, Dan, we can hear you loud and clear. Oh, great. Um, uh, good, good morning, uh, Chair Ryan and Commissioners. My name is Dan Handelman. I use he, him pronouns. I'm with the group Portland Cop Watch. And um, as Mr. Poor said, we realize this discussion for council is focused on whether or not to support paying out $75,000 for more injuries to the community perpetuated by Portland officers. However, we continue to urge council to use these settlement discussions to review policy and training issues which keep leading to harms done and dollars cost. We also continually raise the concern that officers are not necessarily held accountable for actions that led to lawsuits and settlements. So far as we can tell from the police review board reports released to date covering the 2020 protests, at least seven officers have been found out of policy for use of force, but none of the circumstances match what happened to Mr. Hoofnagel. Counting up all the payouts for Portland police violence and protests paid out since 2020, counting the Don't Shoot Portland settlement that was reported in the media but hasn't reached council yet, the city will have paid out just under $1.1 million in 17 incidents. We have heard of a few settlements that came out at $5,001, which means they should, have be, they should be heard by city council as well as since anything over $5,000 is required to be heard by you, but they don't seem to have appeared on the agenda yet. Along those lines, we were quite alarmed to learn that the new charter amendment will allow the mayor to settle any lawsuit up to $50,000 without council input. We urge you, as you are looking at the implementation of the new charter, to exempt lawsuits for police actions that cause community harm other than unintentional vehicle collisions, uh, so that all such settlements are in the public interest and will uh, receive the required council deliberation. Finally, to echo the concerns raised by my colleague, Mr. Porras, about the specific details of this case, it raises a lot of questions about why officers are allowed to use violence against people and claim self-defense when there's no threat of harm, 
while conversely, people who act in a generally nonviolent way to protect themselves or others from police from police harm are treated as criminals posing a risk to the interest of the state. So again, we're not opposed to council accepting this item, but we really hope you'll talk about important police policies, including those around force and crowd control. By coincidence, the revised directive on crowd control, now known as public order events, goes into effect today. Council received recommendations on that policy following a year-long effort by the Citizen Review Committee to gather public input, conduct research, and formulate those recommendations. Yet the only mention of the CRC in the entire package around crowd control is in testimony from Portland Cop Watch. In addition to weighing in yourselves on the policy, you should ask the PPB why they ignore this important advisory body's work. Uh, and thank you for your time. Thank you, Dan. Thanks for being here. Uh, Keelan, is there an administrative uh, uh, edit that we need to make? So yeah, amendment. this, um, we had a request from staff to amend Directive A to update the payee. Okay, can we please hear that amendment? Is it then, Anne, would this be an amendment? Um, it was, it was in, uh, uh, posted to the item on the agenda and included in the agenda updates memo. Um, oh. I can, would you like me to Yeah, please read that? it for the record. Um, so the proposed amendment to Directive A would read, the mayor and city auditor are hereby authorized to draw and deliver a check in the amount of $75,000 made payable to client trust account of the Albi Stark and Guerrero firm. Okay, so now we need to make a amend, we need to second that. Yeah, somebody will need to make the motion. Okay, someone please. Uh, so moved. So moved by second. Commissioner Maps and seconded by Commissioner Gonzalez. Please call the roll. Rubio? Aye. Gonzalez? Aye. Maps? Aye. Ryan? Aye. Okay, now we will go forward with the original item as amended. Okay. Rubio? Okay, please call the roll. Rubio? Aye. Uh, Gonzalez? Aye. Maps? Aye. Ryan? Aye. Okay, ordinance passes. We move on to item 57. Please read the item, Keelan. Amend contract with Facility Force Incorporated to increase amount for enterprise facilities and asset management system. Thank you, uh, Keelan. Uh, colleagues, OMF Facilities Services needs to purchase additional licenses to fund facility assessments, equipment inventories, and asset tagging at 23 OMF locations needed to conduct long range facilities renewal planning. Matei Sauter, manager of the Division of Asset Management, is here to walk us through this item. Welcome, Matei. There you are. Hello. Um, good morning, commissioners. Uh, nice to see you again. My name is Maddie Sauter, and I oversee the Division of Asset Management. So that's two component divisions. It's the fleet organization that manages, acquires, and uh, maintains all of the city's equipment and specialized vehicles, except for fire trucks and golf carts. And then it's also all of uh, many, uh, sorry, a large portion of the city's facilities. So not all of them, but uh, a lot of the core civic facilities that you're familiar with, such as City Hall, Portland Building, uh, most of the police facilities, et cetera. Uh, I'm here today joined by a colleague, Amy Davis, who is the business systems analyst in the facilities organization. I'm acting in uh, uh, the temporary facility director capacity here to support her today. We are requesting an amendment to a contract by a million dollars to help support uh, two pieces of in the implementation of a new information system in our organization. The first is that we have some computer stuff that Amy knows better than I do, uh, licenses, integrations, et cetera, that we need to add to the scope. So that's about half of the request and she's going to explain what that is. And I am here to also speak on behalf of the need for condition data that needs to be gathered and can be expediently gathered through this contract into the system. So with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Amy. Thank you, Maddie. Uh, so we started implementation of this system last year. And since as we've been doing the work, we've identified areas where we can improve operational efficiency and integration with the city's, city's existing financial and procurement system. Uh, this computery part of the request has two components to purchase additional licenses for space management and inventory control uh, is the first one. 
these, these licenses will enable us to administer, define, and evaluate space data for improved short and long-term capacity planning and operations. They will also facilitate implementation of an efficient inventory management program that will help us improve com policy compliance and streamline how equipment parts and components are purchased and controlled. Uh, the second part of this is to provide uh, development services adding to this project to establish strong integration protocols with the city's existing financial and procurement systems. Uh, the integrations consist of data connectors designed to cut down on redundant entries and simplify processes, which will eliminate hundreds of hours of manual work. Uh, these improvements will help us meet our goal of increasing accuracy, availability, and reliability of data, ultimately leading to improved tracking, planning, management, and transparency of costs, budgets, and schedules. Unless there are questions, I'll give it back to Maddie. Uh, maybe we'll take a brief pause to see if anybody has questions on this portion of the amendment. Yeah, thank you, Maddie. Before that, do we have any public testimony? No one signed up. Okay, colleagues, any questions? All right, great presentation, Maddie and Amy. Uh, this item will move on to a second reading. Thanks. Great, thank you. Please read item 58. Amend contract with Universal Protection Service, LP, DBA, Allied Universal Security Services to increase amount by $661,173 for additional professional security officer services. Thank you. Uh, colleagues, this contract amendment will provide increased security within City Hall. John Budkey, Business Systems Analysis for the Integrated Security Program, is here to walk us through the item. Welcome, John. Is John in the house? There he is. Hi. Yay. We can hear you, can John. Can you hear me now? Mm-hmm. You're on. Item 58. John, you're, John, you're muted. You were unmuted a bit ago. Now you're muted, John. John, can you hear us? Sorry, I'm out at uh, PBIM and connectivity is real weird out here. Can you hear me now? We can hear you, John, loud and clear. Okay, sorry about that, folks. Okay. Um, so good morning, commissioners. I apologize for not being there uh, with you this morning, but uh, I'm at an earthquake workshop at PBIM. I'm John Budkey, business systems analyst in the security division. This will be brief. Uh, we've been working very diligently to expand the integrated security program by using a proactive approach towards implementing uh, consultant recommendations made in the security master plan a couple of years back. Uh, this ordinance is simply the next step in the planned effort to improve the safety and security of visiting community members and city staff working in City Hall. And at that point, I'm at, happy to answer any questions that you may have, thanks. Okay, John, anything else? No, it's pretty straightforward. Um, this is part of a regular scheduled plan. There's a timeline for various stages of security, whether it be technology issues or actual physical on-site security, things of that nature. And this is just coming up in the timeline as, okay. I can't say pre-planned, but a general event. Okay, thanks, John. Keelan, is there any public testimony? No one signed up. Okay, colleagues, any questions? Dialogue? All right. Since this is the first reading, the item will move on to a second reading. Please read the next item. Item 59, amend floating structures code to replace floating structures board of appeal with building code board of appeal and make other changes for clarity and consistency. Great, I will turn this over to Commissioner Rubio. Thank you, uh, Council President. First, I want to simply acknowledge that this is the first regular agenda item that I have for the Bureau of Development Services under our new assignments. And I just wanna say I'm really excited to get to work with Dr. or Director Esau, Dr. Esau. Uh, um, and, and her team on many items to come. Uh, by way of background on this item, the Bureau regulates floating structures and marinas within the city through Title 28. 
and on changes to Title 28 related to floating structures, BDS staff meet regularly with the River Community Advisory Committee to discuss those changes as well as any issues related to floating structures. The purpose of this ordinance is to incorporate recent discussions and recommendations of the River Community Advisory Committee, but in short, we are eliminating the floating structures code board of appeals and transferring that work to the building code board of appeal. The former body has only met once during its, in, in, in its existence, and that was over 15 years ago. Um, I certainly put this simple move into our collective work to find opportunities to streamline and better deliver services. Um, I also want to acknowledge that the Bureau has deleted the term grandfather in the portion of our code, and I appreciate the thoughtfulness as the origin of, of that word um, for this country. It's not something we want to um, continue forward. So here to explain the changes in more detail is Nancy Thorrington with BDS. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Rubio, and uh, good morning, commissioners, and welcome, um, Commissioner Gonzalez. I'm Nancy Thorrington with the Bureau of Development Services. Um, uh, I think uh, Commissioner Rubio said uh, much of what's, uh, what's in this. Basically, there's two parts to this ordinance. Um, Title 28 regulates uh, floating structures, which is basically floating homes and the related uh, journey and making a few definitional changes. The, um, the main part of this, though, is to replace the uh, Floating Structures Board of Appeal with the Building Code Board of Appeal. Um, that, both of those boards are our, what, what are called our external boards. We basically have two levels of appeals. We have a, an internal board that meets weekly, and then we have the external boards. The, we want to replace the existing Building Code, I mean the uh, Floating Structures Board of Appeal with the Building Code Board of Appeal and have somebody from the River Community Advisory Committee sit uh, in on any appeals that occur. That will keep people from having to be appointed to a board that you know, meets like once in since 2009. It's the last time it met and it's only met once. So you know, we, we don't wanna put that kind of burden on our, on our uh, community members who volunteer for these boards. So, so that, that basically, uh, summarizes this ordinance and with that if you have any questions I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you Nancy. Thank you Commissioner Rubio. Anyone sign up for public testimony? No one signed up. Okay any questions from colleagues? Okay this is a first reading. The item will now move on to second reading. Thanks again Nancy. Thank item number 60. If you could please read Keelan. Authorized conveyance of city-owned real property sorry, uh, real property located at 1103 through 1121 Southwest Harvey Milk Street and rehabilitation financing not to exceed $8,500,000 to Home Forward or an affiliate for an affordable housing project. Thanks, Keelan. Mm -hmm. I have the pleasure of turning this over to the Housing Commissioner, Rubio. Thank you, uh, Council President Ryan. I'm happy to introduce this emergency ordinance to allow Home Forward to acquire and renovate the Fairfield Apartments, which the Portland Housing Bureau has owned and operated since 2010. The Fairfield is an existing residence in downtown Portland, serving very low income individuals with the ground floor hosting the beloved Roxy Restaurant. The proposed funding from the city will use river, river District tax increment financing and a direct congressional allocation of federal housing and urban development funds. This project will leverage over 27 million of other public and private financing and preserve 75 units of permanent supportive housing designated for our neediest residents. Thank you to developer Home Forward and its partner Urban League of Portland for their support of the funding request during the federal appropriations process. I will now turn it over to Interim Housing Bureau Director Molly Rogers. Thank you, Commissioner Rubio. Good morning, commissioners. For the record, my name is Molly Rogers and I'm the Interim Director of the Portland Housing Bureau. And I am joined today by Ivory Matthews, the Executive Director of Home Forward. Can we pull up the slides, Keelan? Um, Molly, did you send them to our office? Uh, I believe our office did, but I'm, I have staff here ready to go in case they needed to be shared the screen. Yeah, we didn't receive them, I'm sorry. Okay, so yeah. Oh, 
All right, I've got Jill Chen here online to show some slides. Yep. Thank you. Let me go ahead and get this on video. Can you all see? Yes, we can. Well, we can hear and Great. see you, but we don't see the slides yet. You don't see the slides yet. No. Oh. Now we, it's close. There, there it is. Go. Next slide, Jill. Okay. Let me get it into, um, can you see it now? Yes. Yes. Thank okay. you. We are pleased to present the renovation and preservation of the Fairfield Apartments. The Fairfield is a single room occupancy building located at Southwest Harvey Milk Street and Southwest 11th Avenue in downtown Portland. Next slide, uh, Jill. The property was built in 1911 and was assumed by PHB in 2010 by the Portland Development Commission. Jill, can we go to the next slide? We're only seeing the intro slide, just FYI. Oh, sorry, technical difficulties. There, oh. There we go. Wait, you seeing it now? Um, now we just need this, the one prior. There we go. This re un unreinforced masonry structure requires significant rehabilitation to meet current life, fire, and safety codes and increase livability for its residents. The property is currently home to extremely low-income residents of which 96% earn less than 30% of area median income, and 43% of whom have no income. Next slide. Home Forward's renovation of the Fairfield will preserve 75 supportive housing units, helping to prevent the displacement of highly vulnerable individuals in a central location near transit services and neighborhood amenities. All 75 will be designated as permanent supportive housing with rents supported by HUD, project-based Section 8 vouchers, and services provided by the Urban League of Portland. All units will be avail affordable to individuals earning up to 30% of area median income and will have rents su um, supported by the Section 8 vouchers, which what this means is that the residents pay roughly about 30% of their income towards the rent and the subsidy pays the difference. The borrower will enter into a regulatory agreement with PHB to maintain the affordability of the project for 99 years. Next slide. Oops, sorry. Construction will start in early 2023, and residents will begin moving back during the spring of 2024. Current residents are receiving relocation assistance from Home Forward and have the option to return to the Fairfield after project completion. The rehabilitation scope of work includes seismic and structural improvements, roof and window replacement, plumbing and electrical upgrades, elevator replacement, right now it's original from 1911 and actually is out of service as of last year, and additional improvements to modernize the building while preserving its historic character. Amenities include space for on-site resident services and property management as well as 24-hour desk coverage. Home Forward has been working with a third party sustainable building consultant to incorporate green building features that include LED lighting, energy efficient appliances and fixtures, high performance windows, energy recovery ventilation, and a focus on sustainable and durable materials. The project team expects to exceed PHB's equity and contracting goals of 30% disadvantaged minority women emerging small business firms, utilization for hard costs, and 20% utilization for prof professional services. Next slide. The 75 permanent supportive housing units will receive funding for services up to 10,000 per household per year from the Joint Office of Homeless Services. Individuals who are experiencing or are at risk of homelessness will be referred to the Fairfield through the Joint Office's Coordinated Access System. 
and Home Forward provides the project-based Section 8 vouchers for the PSH units. The Urban League of Portland will provide culturally specific case management and peer support for PSH households. They sent they send their regrets. They were not able to make it today, but uh, next slide. But just as a, a summary, they will be providing um, resident services as, at, as well as the Fairfield, and but focusing on life skills, asset building, health, and housing retention. And a suite of services will be provided as listed below on this slide. Next slide. The proposed city funding of 8.5 million is leveraged approximately 3.3 times, raising over 27 million of other public and private financing. Private financing is contributed by investor US Bank and lender KeyBank, and public support is from the Oregon Housing and Community Services Department and Prosper Portland. PHB's funding includes two million in HUD community project funds set aside by Congress for the Fairfield. Next slide. In sum, we are asking council to authorize conveyance of the city-owned site and funding up to 8.5 million to Home Forward or an affiliate and authorize the interim director of PHB to execute, amend, or modify uh, at documents to advance this project. And with that, I would love to turn it over to Irene Matthews. Thank you, Molly. Good morning, uh, in absence of uh, Mayor Wheeler, uh, Commissioner Rubio, uh, Commissioner Ryan, it was certainly a pleasure working with you uh, for the short time frame, and also members of Portland City Council. For the record, my name is Ivory Matthews, and I use she, she, her pronouns, and I am the Chief Executive Officer of Home Forward. Thank you for the opportunity to present in support of authorizing conveyance of the Fairfield Departments to Home Forward or an affiliate, and authorize the Interim Director of the Portland Housing Bureau to execute the necessary documents to advance the project forward. Home Forward is the housing authority for Multnomah County and the largest housing authority in the state of Oregon and one of the original HUD designated moving to work agencies, which allows Home Forward to be more creative and innovative in how we serve the community. We own over 7,000 units of affordable housing and serve over 15,000 households monthly with rent assistance throughout Multnomah County. We administer a variety of rent assistance programs, including 11,000 housing choice vouchers, a short-term rent assistance program that consolidates funding from several sources and aids through 19 social service providers. We provide property management services to many of our 110 housing sites and a robust resident services to support our diverse resident needs. Home Forward also plays a major role in the development of affordable housing. We have preserved in Multnomah County over 1,700 homes through major renovation. 596 units are currently under construction, um, of which all will be completed in 2023. 880 units with construction starts in 23 and 24. 165 permanent supportive units under construction or in the pipeline to include Fairfield Apartments, uh, Hattie Redmond, and uh, Southeast Powell. We also partner with um, 100 community organizations to make this happen. We have a strong asset management and development department that focuses on preserving our existing portfolio and creating new affordable housing for our community. We have been uh, close jurisdictional partners with the Portland Housing Bureau by blending our resources <clears throat> at the Fairfield and other projects. Excuse me. To ensure that our most vulnerable neighbors are stably and permanently housed. This, this project um, has been a partnership with Portland Housing Bureau since 2018. We are thankful for your partnerships and commitment to rehabbing this historic building so that it can be a long-term asset to our low income community and our downtown core. Thanks to your funding and forethought, we will be able to preserve commercial space that fronts the vibrant streets of Southwest 11th and Southwest Harvey Milk Street. 
preserve and um, seismetically upgrade 75 units of very low income housing for chronically homeless individuals and provide ongoing culturally appropriate, appropriate supportive services by the Urban League of Portland. The Fairfield Apartments will provide, um, as Molly stated, permanent supportive housing for chronically homeless um, with an emphasis on providing uh, those individuals who are black American residents with a special focus on victims of domestic violence and our LGBTQ um, communities. And this was something that um, Commissioner um, uh, Ryan was uh, certainly supportive of, so thank you for that. Um, as you all know, these populations are disproportionately impacted by uh, homelessness. We are very excited that our partnerships with the Urban League of Portland, who will provide these services, are going to be truly instrumental in keeping these families stably housed. Lastly, I will share, um, thanks to the ambition, ambitious goals and the commitments of our partners, Walsh Construction, we anticipate exceeding our minority um, women and emerging small business goals to achieve a participation rate of 35 percent. Thank you for this opportunity to ensure that our residents of the Fairfield will remain stably housed, that this historic building will be preserved, and that a collaborative approach will provide wraparound services for our residents. Thank you. Okay. Does that conclude your report? Okay. Great. Is there any public testimony before we go into questions? No one signed up. Okay, great. Colleagues, any questions of our STEAM panel? Just have a quick one. Sure. Uh, in terms of the Joint Office on Homelessness's uh, commitment to provide services, could you just give a high level how that works? Is it a year to year or is it uh, over an extended period of time in terms of the commitment? Uh, yes, we, we work very closely with the Joint Office when we put together solicitations. So in um, examples like that, we, they, they've been clear that they can provide up to 10,000 per household per year um, for however their authorization period goes. They, we work with them on a contractual basis. Um, I will have to get back to you on the specific term of that contract, but the intention is to continue as, as long as resources are available. Um, and then with those, uh, they enter into contracts with service providers that then work with the um, site staff and work with the owners and to, um, to ensure that they're providing the services that they set out to do. Got it. And one minor question. You described the relocation assistance for existing residents. Can you just kind of give general color how that works mechanically on the ground to make sure those folks aren't displaced extensively? Absolutely. We've gone through a series of actually some emergency relocation of residents when the elevator went down. Luckily, we had Home Forward already ready to go, and they have an extensive relocation team that I'm sure Irie can speak more elaborately on. But just in general, um, we were able to, they were able to leverage Home Forward's existing either downtown buildings or other su publicly supported buildings that they can move people into for the time period of the construction. And the people are paying the same amount in rent as they would be if they were at the Fairfield. So then they have the ability to move back if they so choose. Yeah. I agree. I think you summed it up. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, both of you. Okay, colleagues, this is an emergency <laughs> ordinance. If there's no more questions, Keelan, please call the roll. Rubio. I want to thank Interim Director Rogers for her excellent leadership on this project um, and also give appreciation to Director Matthews of Home Forward and also um, our other partner, Urban League of Portland. Um, this project is a special one, and it helps to finally address um, some much needed housing, um, affordable housing and culturally responsive support services to an incredibly underserved community. So I want to also thank my colleague, uh, Commissioner Dan Ryan, for his stewardship and leadership also on this project. Uh, Commissioner, I know this was a special one for you. So I'm very happy to vote aye. Gonzalez. Aye. Maps. I'd like to thank Commissioner Ryan, Commissioner Rubio, our congressional delegation, the Housing Bureau, Home Forward, and the Urban League for their work on this important project. I'm glad to see this uh, project move forward, which is one of the many reasons I vote aye. Ryan. Yes, I want to actually start off by acknowledging <coughs> Congresswoman Suzanne Bonamici. Uh, I think some of you know her and her husband uh, were in a pedestrian, they were hit by a car on Friday night. They're both doing well, but I just want to acknowledge um, her, she was a champion in Washington, D.C. to deliver the, 
the rounding up of investments necessary to, to make this project really go forward and know that we could feel comfortable that it was uh, financed to completion. So thank you so much, uh, Congresswoman, for your steadfast commitment. And I really have to also say um, this one was one of those items where I dove in a little bit deeper. Um, there was uh, two buildings in that area that were going that are going up, and we needed to get some storefront activation in at least one of them. It's a really, really popular pedestrian uh, thoroughfare of our downtown area, and so I wanted to make sure that we saw pedestrian uh, activation in life going forward. So I appreciate the nimbleness and how the Housing Bureau worked with us to make that happen. Uh, it's really good to see you, uh, Ivory. <laughs> you know, when you're in this job for over two years and you've had numerous meetings with someone and they're almost all in these little boxes, it's, uh, it's, it's always a little bit of a startling, wonderful moment when you get to see someone mm -hmm. in person. So thank you. I'm glad you're transitioned from South Carolina. The, what's it called, the Pimento State? Does it South Carolina have? I do like um, pimento cheese, but it's palmetto. Oh, okay. <laughs> I, I think I hear that now and then. I don't really know what that is. But um, welcome. And you are now, I lived here through a couple rainy seasons, so you're an Oregonian. And we appreciate your leadership. Uh, seeing the way you knitted together the partners with the Urban League, um, I, I appreciate this, the historical significance that you understand about this area. It's now called Southwest Harvey Milk Street. and. Uh, for the, it's a historic area for the LGBTQIA community. It says here, going back several decades, I can testify it goes back at least four decades as I used to roam those parts in the early 80s. And so it's really exciting to know that we're activating that very precious part of our city. And I really appreciate the way you've uh, brought in the partners that are necessary to deliver the services that are relevant. Uh, I also just want to pause to say that I had the pleasure while I was at the Housing Bureau of seeing a lot of activation. Um, since uh, December of 2021 alone, 2,900 affordable units have been in development. And the housing bond was passed successfully, and I know there was uh, some challenges, because there always are when you're starting to build something new and different, but it's, very, it's accelerated over the last couple of years, and I know that will continue here in 2023. And so this is an exciting step in that process. It will be great to keep collaborating with Commissioner Rubio and her amazing team. The future is in good hands. I vote aye. Authorized competitive solicitation and execution of price agreements for staff augmentation to support the Bureau of Environmental Services Capital Improvement Program with construction management, inspection, and program support services not to exceed $18 million over five years. Uh, thank you, uh, President Ryan. Colleagues, this item comes to us from the Bureau of Environmental Services. With this ordinance, Environmental Services seeks this council's approval to hire temporary staff to support in-house construction management, inspection, and program support on an as-needed basis. This ordinance is necessary because BES is increasing its capital improvement program budget over the next five to 10 years in order to meet the new regulatory mandates and to keep pace with the needs of a growing city and an aging sewer and stormwater system. This ordinance is an important tool that will help BES ensure continuous and efficient service and avoid costly project delays. The average annual cost of these temporary hires is expected to be $3.6 million. This contract will run for five years, so the expected cost of this contract shall not exceed $18 million. Now, before I turn the floor over to staff, I should be clear on one last point. This contract does not authorize an increase to utility rates. Instead, the funds for this program will be charged to the Bureau of Environmental Services. Super Operations Analyst with BES Engineering. Okay, and um, is there a slideshow? Okay, uh, great. Um, uh, next slide, please. 
right, so uh, I'm here today to request that council authorize BES to solicit and execute uh, price agreements for temporary staffing support for construction, inspection, and program support services. The resulting price agreements from this RFP will have a cumulative total value of about $306.9 million, sorry, $3.6 million per year or $18 million over five years. Um, our goal is to post this RFP next month in February and have these price agreements executed uh, by me. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, now I'll just give a, a brief uh, background here. With Council's request and support to convert five temporary contract staff positions to permanent city full-time equivalents or FTEs in the fiscal 23 uh, fall bump, and seven in fiscal, plan seven in fiscal year 24 and one in fiscal year 25, we were able to significantly reduce the planned value of these price agreements. We want to especially thank Commissioner Maps and Michelle Rodriguez for their leadership and support for getting the FTE planning and approval done. Because we were able to significantly reduce these, um, we had planned about $40 million over five years and up to 35 temporary staff, and we effectively cut that in half to about 18 million and about 17 staff. And so our estimated cost is now from $8 million to 3.6. Um, we reduced it from 8 million to 3.6 million. So we had just under, or a little more than half. So this was a, what we call a win-win situation where we were able to save some money. And also there's a lot of value in converting the contract employees to city employees for their own professional development. Cause that is typically their, their end game is to become city employees. All right. Um, so future requests, so we, I guess the, the main point here I also want to make is um, we had approval in the fall bump. So a key with this, with, the, with our request is to get approval for the, the future year requests that were planned that will come to you um, the next year and the year after so we can stay within this uh, contract amount. Um, if those FTEs are not approved, we may need to come back and request additional um, contract capacity here to, for more contract FTE. All right. Right, next slide, please. So I'm gonna briefly talk through why BES uses temporary staff to support the delivery of our capital improvement plan. Um, our CIP is focused on upgrading and replacing our aging stormwater and sanitary sewer infrastructure facilities that range from nearing the end of their service life to being beyond the end of their service. To ensure reliability and prevent costly emergencies, these facilities need to be rehabilitated or replaced. Uh, we also have new facilities that need to be uh, built to improve services to our community. Uh, using temporary staffing service gives us supplemental construction and inspection support for a variety of projects, including storm and sanitary sewers, pump stations, treatment facilities, and drainage way improvements. These projects have varying schedules and require adapting quickly to project changes. Relying on a mix of FTEs, consultants, and temporary staff to work on these critical asset projects gives the Bureau the flexibility to adapt to changing schedules, resource gaps, and unexpected projects. Temporary staff positions also create opportunities for workforce development by allowing contract staff to gain on-the-job training. So next slide, please. I think that is everything that we have. So we will say thank you and open it up for questions. Great, before that, is there any public testimony, Keelan? No one signed up. Okay, colleagues, any questions? This is a first reading, this will move on to a second reading. Thanks so much. You're welcome, thank you. Thanks. Okay, next item, 62, correct? Author yes, that's correct. Authorized competitive solicitation and execution of price agreements for small capital unit price construction contracts over three years. Great. Commissioner Maps, take it away. Uh, thank you, President Ryan. Colleagues, I'm excited to introduce this ordinance because this item is a great example of how good government and valuing equity can complement each other. 
This ordinance comes to us from the Bureau of uh, Transportation Services, uh, PBOT. Uh, with this item, this council directs PBOT to reauthorize a price agreement for small capital unit price contracts. Now, these price agreements allow PBOT to do business with small contractors from the city's prime contractor development program. Of course, the purpose of the Prime Contractor Development Program is to create a marketplace for the City of Portland to purchase goods and services from business in between $100,000 and $500,000. Over the next three years, we expect this ordinance to contribute $7 million a year towards mission-critical capital improvement projects. I should add that this ordinance does not require any new funding. Instead, the resources for this program, um, for projects, uh, instead the resources for this project uh, shall be charged to the capital improvement projects served by this program. Uh, here to tell us more about this ordinance, we have Scott Clement, uh, Supervising Engineer with PBOT. Welcome, Scott. Thank you, and good afternoon. Um, PBOT's requesting approval for reauthorizing this three-year price agreement for small cap unit price contracts. We affectionately call this the SCUPSI contract. The, some unique as aspects of this contract. This contract can be described as a fixed unit price indefinite quantity contract. In this contract, we, the city, determine what we believe to be fair market price for the bid items included. And we include those prices in the bid tab. The contractors then review these prices, and based on their costs, they submit a bid with a multiplier. Award of the contracts is based on the contractor's multiplier. Another unique aspect of this is that at the time of bid, there is no project specificity. Mm -hmm. Contractors don't know where the work's going to be, and nor do we. But to enable us to award the bid, the bid is structured so the contractors are able to submit a bid for work and projects yet not yet defined. PBOT wasn't the first bureau in the city to use this contract method. Our friends at Bureau of Environmental Services were the first, and in fact, that contract came out in November of 2014, and they called that contract PERUSE. And that acronym stands for the, uh, where is that? The PERUSE is the, uh, Urgent Repair of sanita Sanitary and Storm Sewers. Um, in the current contract, we have eight bidders. We awarded seven contracts, and the multipliers of the awards varied from 1.15 to 1.35. To date, we've completed 22 projects, completed approximately $5 million worth of work, and we've constructed over 250 ramps citywide. Contracts also allowed PBOT to quickly complete some unique projects, projects such as the placement of marine barriers on, or, or uh, barriers on Marine Drive to keep vehicles from driving on the levees. It also allowed us to close down the Oak Street for the future construction of the Plaza and Play Street on Oak Street. This contract, as mentioned, will enable us to deliver up to $7 million per year of constructed capital improvement projects. This approach allows PBOT to move very quickly without going through a lengthy standard procurement process. The contract may be renewed twice for a total contract duration of three years. And finally, as mentioned, this contract will further the city's efforts to use contractors in the city's prime contractor development program, providing them more experience in all aspects of completing small to medium sized projects for PBOT and for the city. Thank you. Thank you, Scott, and thank you for your patience. Uh, why don't we go to see if there's any public testimony? No one's saying There's it. none. Colleagues, any questions? Okay, this is emergency ordinance, and if there's no more deliberation, Keelan, please call the roll. Rubio. Um, I, I think this is a great project. It's a win-win, um, um, and small contractors will gain valuable experience, and will also be able to move these projects uh, through more quickly. I vote aye. Gonzalez. Aye. Maps. Aye. Ryan. Scott, thanks for your patience. You nailed it. You said good afternoon. Uh, <laughs> Scott, fast noon. Anyway, aye. Okay, passes um, unanimously and on to item 63. 
authorize Portland Water Bureau Director to execute certain intergovernmental utility and cooperative improvement agreements with the Oregon Department of Transportation for projects that have potable water infrastructure services in construction areas. Okay, Commissioner Maps. Uh, thank you. Colleagues, this item comes to us from the Portland Water Bureau. This item deals with some, uh, frankly, arcane arc accounting rules that govern how the Water Bureau and ODOT charge each other when we work together on joint infrastructure projects. Uh, today, I'll let staff walk you through the details of this proposal. Um, today, um, I want to limit my comments uh, uh, um, to highlight some um, high-level issues that I hope Council and the public will uh, take from this ordinance. Let me start with some background. Uh, the Water Bureau and ODOT often partner together to build or improve infrastructure in the Portland metro area. When we engage in projects like that, the city is often obliged to meet deadlines set by the state. And those deadlines are often shorter than the uh, city's bureaucratic processes can accommodate. The ordinance before us today removes a barrier to meeting ODOT deadlines for smaller infrastructure projects that involve the Water Bureau. This ordinance does that by authorizing the director of the Water Bureau to enter into agreements with ODOT for projects that cost up to half a million dollars. Now, under the current rules, IGAs like that typically come to council where they usually land on the consent agenda. Um, I'll close by pointing out that there's ample precedent for reforms like the one uh, proposed in this ordinance. For example, the director of the uh, Portland Water Bureau already has authority to sign certain agreements and easements and leases and uh, licenses for the Portland Water Bureau. However, currently, the director of the Water Bureau does not have the authority to sign any of the ODOT type agreements. Mm -hmm which is why this ordinance is necessary. Now, uh, here today to tell us more about this proposal, we have Jody Inman, Chief Engineer with the Portland Water Bureau. Welcome, Jody. Good afternoon, as um, I was reminded by the previous um, testifier. So good afternoon, thank you, Commissioner Maps. Um, good afternoon, council members, and welcome, Commissioner Gonzalez. My name is Jody Inman, and I am the Chief Engineer for the Portland Water Bureau. So as Commissioner Maps always does a great job of introducing and giving background, we are here today to, with an ordinance that we developed in collaboration with the Oregon Department of Transportation. And I'm happy to say that because we can't always really celebrate where we have collaborated with some of our partner agencies in an effort to both meet our mutual goals. So this ordinance is really intended to help expedite the city process for smaller ODOT projects. So as you know, the Oregon Department of Transportation takes on many projects in our community, many of which improve safety and multimodal transportation options. At times, these projects impact the existing water infrastructure underneath the roads, requiring that, that those water assets be relocated. In order to relocate the water assets, we must enter into an agreement with ODOT one of those interagency agreements or cooperative utility agreements. We very specifically labeled the three that are most common for reimbursing ODOT for work that their contractors do to relocate water assets. And if at times we have had ordinances that have come before council that purely allow the Oregon Department of Transportation to pay back the Portland Water Bureau for work that its crews and staff members do. That is part of the driver for why we are here today. We would like to simplify and expedite the process to help to get the Water Bureau re, uh, reimbursed for the work that we're doing. So often, ODOT is working under these expedited time into agreements with ODOT up to rules, IG. and easement to sign any why this to tell us more about here for the Portland Water Bureau do we have any public testimony Keelan no one signed up okay colleagues any questions for Jody 
Okay, Keelan, uh, this is not a, we're not voting on this, it's a first reading, and we'll go to the second reading. Thanks so much for being here, Jody. Thanks Thank for you. your patience. Yeah. Okay, colleagues, that concludes all our items on our morning agenda, and I will see all of you at 2 p.m., and this meeting is adjourned.